we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. Friday night here on Spaced Out Radio. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for joining us. And yes, Random Guy does have aliens. We have proven that. Tonight, we're getting into near-death experiences, what it's like to see the other side. Reverend Karen Herrick is here tonight to talk about it. But first, we say hello to all of you. And who are you? Race fan in the gold medal position. Penny Van with the silver. Robert Lamoth taking home the bronze medal tonight. Hi, Chris716, Roy Boy. Markham, how you doing, buddy? I emailed you back. Never heard back from you, though, buddy. Uh, Brown Dwarf and Michael Morris, good to see you. Kim Stanley is here. Kim will be signing autographs after the show. Line them to the left of the studio, if you don't mind, to the left of the studio. Donna, my dear, over in uh, Manitoba, I got your email, and thank you so much. Appreciate you. Thank you very, very much. Donald G. Van, welcome to SOR Chat. Kurt M. Evan Walters is back. He's pissing me off, but I can tell you this. Evan will be signing autographs after the show as well. Line up to the right of the studio, if you don't mind, to the right of the studio. W. David Page, thank you so much for kicking off the Super Chat tonight. Very much appreciate your love and support. The Super Chat is a wonderful way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. Laura Lobbs underscore Maddie and OB Flett. How you guys doing? Dave Walters. I am Pam. I am Pam. I am Pam. Yeah, I am officially Pam. Tim Mothman, Nancy Thames, Nancy Hayes, and number six in your program, starting on defense from Stockholm, Sweden, Lars Janssen. Lightwalkers, how you doing? Little Timmy Senor, good to see you. How did I make you laugh out loud? I don't get it. I don't get it. Emmy Tong and Forrest Louie. Forrest Louie, thank you so much for that wonderful super chat, my friend. We really do appreciate your love of this show. Let's continue on. Derek Galloway, James Weston, the lovely Kira. How are you? National Memorial, good morning to you. Julie Van D, how you doing? And uh, let's see here. Bob Vila over on Facebook. Oh, that's my cousin. That's my cousin. Matt Geek, how are you? Uh, sweet Tony D, good to see you. I am Pam, by the way. And Jay Burke, Gong Show. Doug Shelby is here. The Doug Shelby has arrived, which means we can officially start this show. Okay, moving on on our roll call. And there's Jacqueline Kiros, or Cuevas, pardon me. Uh, Jacqueline, welcome to SOR Chat. Pam Harris, good to see you. Hi, Sandra. Hi, Sandra. Hi, Sandra. We are about 90 seconds away from launching this show tonight, and it's going to be a good one. It really is going to be a good one, and I look forward to it. Uh, Reverend Karen Herrick is going to be our guest tonight here on the show, and of course, we have all of you joining us. Reminder to all of you, you have 24 hours, 24 hours to join us in Las Vegas on a VIP ticket for the second annual Spaced Out Radio Fan Party, May 19th through 21st at the Golden Nugget Casino in Las Vegas. Bob Vila, my cousin, will be signing autographs there. Yeah, he will. And uh, if you're lucky, he'll make you a birdhouse. Gizmo, how are you? But we want to see all of you. we got a great, great event planned up for you. The swag bags are starting to fill up. 
and we're going to have a great old time. Let's get Spreaker going here. So that way we can get Bill WD-40 into the chat room. And that way he can lube us up for tonight's show because you always want to be lubed up before a big show like we're going to have tonight. Gizmo, my man, how are you? Probably already said that. That's okay. we got 30 seconds before we launch here on tonight. Hi, Jenny. How are you? Good to see you. Thank you for coming in. And the Spaced Out Radio store on our website is open at spacedoutradio.com. Get great swag there. Uh, C-Tech, how you doing? Hey, you were great on Ro- with uh, Rob G tonight, man. You were great. Thank you for uh, the knowledge, man. Appreciate you. And uh, let's see, 10 seconds. John Sabe Malan. Bonjour, comment ça va? And here we go, everyone. Do us a favor. Horns up. Let's rock it out right now. Central British Columbia to you listening around the world. This, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on Odyssey Radio, Talk Streams Live, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Join us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do old Davey the favor. Hit that subscribe button. You can follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the news, wire, check out our swag as well. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by listening to Chive Charities today. You can find them. On our website, a great show of information tonight as we have Reverend Karen Herrick here talking about near-death experiences and spiritual encounters. Oh, it's going to be good. Then in hour number three, we're going to head to the swamp. Right after that, little Timmy Senor is going to be here for the UFO report. Reverend Karen Herrick, Ph.D., completed her master's degree at Rutgers University in Social Work and Ph.D. at Union Institute uh, and University. She wrote her book, You're Not Finished Yet, which encapsulates her private practice work, plus an additional two chapters on spirituality and spiritual experiences after she had a Holy Spirit experience during holotropic breathwork training. Her thesis was entitled Naming Spiritual Experiences. 75% of the 133 mental health professionals she researched stated that they believed further education regarding spiritual experiences, near-death experiences, and or afterlife experiences would be beneficial to them personally and professionally. That is absolutely amazing. Reverend Karen E. Herrick, thank you so much for coming on Spaced Out Radio tonight. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it too. And and you know, one of the things that every person has in common is we're going to die. We all pay taxes and we're going to die. That's, That's it. True. You know, and otherwise, you know, we are very creative in each of our own ways, but I think for a lot of us out there, you know, we are wondering what actually happens. Are we one and done like the scientists say we are? Or is there something more? How did you become attracted to this topic? How did I become? Okay. Um, Well, I started the Center for Children of Alcoholics, which was my private practice. And so a lot of people that came to me um, had lived in trauma and sexual abuse and all kinds of, you know, horrendous things. And we have since learned that people that lived in trauma, they had the ability to disassociate easier than other people because they do that um, in childhood to get out of their house, uh, you know, mentally. And um, so one of the things that comes to you when you've been living in trauma is you have the ability to disassociate easier. And therefore you may have more spiritual experiences 
than other people who lived a more, you know, well, I wouldn't say normal because I think normal is dysfunctional, but lived a life that with less trauma. So I, I started hearing all these stories. And um, and then eventually I, I went to some holotropic breathwork training, like you said, where you lay down and listen to music that activates your chakra system. And um, I didn't know what I was doing. It was educational. And um, I felt this other breath come into my body. And um, I thought, whose breath is that? But we were told, don't think, just breathe during this whole thing. So I breathed and the breath breathed for a while. And then after that, I had um, experienced my my original birth and coming in here, which I think it must be easier to die than to be born because there was a lot of pushing and pushing and not knowing, you know, if you're going to make it. Um, so as a result of all of that, I just got so interested in how, how do I explain this to people? Because I could explain to you the unconscious and, and complexes and what happens to you, um, you know, when you don't work on your complexes, but I couldn't explain this. So I had to do some more research. So for you, it was a curiosity. Did you always believe in an afterlife? I mean, being educated within uh, your system, a lot of people with your type of education are usually either very agnostic or, or very atheist. Um, well, no, um, I, I believe there was something. It was more like the American Indians belief in nature. I was raised in upstate New York, which is very beautiful. And, you know, nature happens and everything, it seems to be um, very organized. And um, so I thought, well, the, the wind was important. And uh, but I wasn't sure about God and, you know, this guy with a white beard or anything like that. Um, but I took my kids to church and just kind of, you know, bumbled along. And then when I became a therapist, um, I decided I would um, study some of this. So then I decided to take the reverend training and um, I could marry you and bury you. But I don't do that. Um, mostly what I do is help people who are upset that maybe they were raised Catholic and now they don't want to be Catholic. So I, I help them handle that guilt, et cetera. Uh, so I wasn't really very religious and I'm, I'm more spiritual now than anything. Yes, me too. Me too. The way you have advanced in this subject with your own study, what, what has been excitement for you and what have you learned after all these years? Well, I think exciting is um, knowing about William James and uh, the father of American psychology and Carl Jung, who was a Swiss psychologist, um, and they believed in mediumship. They believed in an afterlife. Um, they believed in religious experiences. But when we go to school, we don't learn that part about them. Uh, we just learn about the psychological viewpoint. But nobody taught me about the paranormal or that Carl Jung's mother was psychic and um, his grandfather and his second wife used to talk to his first wife at lunch and she was on the other side. I thought, how come we didn't get all this neat stuff? Um, and so um, that, that excites me, Jungian psychology, because Jung believed you had a soul and your reason for being here was that you have a soul purpose and you're supposed to find out what that is and really live this life. For you, the, in working with people and understanding what people go through from, from trauma to the, the highest points of happiness, how do people react to the fact that, you know, death is looming and, you know, we're here for a good time, not a long time, like, like uh, was sung in the song. And, and, you know, there's a lot of things that we try and pack in in a very finite amount of time. Yes. Well, I don't, most people don't think about death and they don't want to talk about it. Um, so then when they lose somebody, when they have a death of a significant person in their life, um, it's it's a time sometimes when they have a spiritual experience themselves. And because um, one of the things that I do to help people in chronic grief is to recommend that they go to a medium to make a contact with their deceased loved one. Uh, because they, they can't seem to get out of the guilt of I didn't do enough and they died or, um, you know, life was too short and all this grief and uh, chronic, uh, you know, depression that they have. So I want them to know that their loved one is still on the other side in, in spirit form and they can still contact them. 
uh, through a medium and then eventually figure out how to contact them by themselves. Um, but most people don't want to talk about death and they don't believe that there is something else, you know, a lot of them, or they, they say, well, there's heaven or like if, if you came to me and, and your, um, your favorite uncle Charlie had died and I would say, you know, well, what was Charlie like? And, and you would tell me, and, you know, you might have some pictures on your phone and we talk about Charlie. And then I would say, well, uh, what do you think Charlie is? Oh, well, he's in heaven or he's in a good place because he was a good person. And um, and where they have the guilt is if somebody killed themselves because then they believe that, you know, they're going to be in hell for the rest of their life. And I don't I believe hell is how we think. Um, so I don't think there's there's a hell. Um, so anyway, but when I ask people, they usually know where Charlie went. So they do believe in some kind of an afterlife when they're telling me about their deceased loved one. So then we can we can we can build on that. And then I say, well, you know, there's been a lot of research about um, immortality uh, recently and not now, but as we get into the therapy, would you like to know more about that research? Yes, I would. How do you how are you convinced through your education and through your studies that the ultimate question of whether or not we continue on after we pass away from this life. How are you so exact in your thoughts about that? Because as I'm one of those people, I would classify as someone who absolutely fears death. I have for a long time. And I'll be honest with you, uh, Reverend Karen, it scares the daylights out of me. To the okay. point where I can already feel my anxiety starting to build up with this topic. But it intrigues me at the exact same time because I'm going to be 50 years old this year. And I look back and I'm thinking, man, two thirds of my life already gone. And I haven't even started having fun yet. You know, <laughs> and then you think yeah. about, oh, God, now I haven't even started having fun yet. And I got a plan on retiring within the next 15 to 20 years. I'm nowhere near prepared for that. You know, I'm still acting like a 20 year old kid at turning 50. Well, like where the hell am I supposed to go? You know, but that doesn't mean like I am. a, And I say that as a believer in God yeah. and as a, a believer in, in my own spiritual sense. So, I mean, how do you calm someone down with that conviction that there is something more? Well, let's see. Um, I, have, I have a couple answers for that. Um, number one, you have two bodies. You have the physical body that you're in right now. And then inside of your physical body is your spiritual body, meaning an etheric body that, that is broken down when it leaves your physical body into molecules and atoms, and it contains your soul. And your soul is immortal. So it has to go back up there. So you need a spiritual body to take it back up. And so in my research, I've learned about the vagus nerve, which is your 10th and longest nerve in your body. Starts out at the top of your head, comes down around your neck, touches the amygdala, which is fight, flight, and frozen. And so we use it in psychology with your physical body. And then the vagus nerve goes down the spinal column into your heart and into your stomach. And Darwin discovered this in the 1700s, and he called it the pneumogastric nerve. And he said, what happens is that you are triggered somehow, your fear, and your stomach tells your brain danger, danger, and your heart rate goes up. And he was right. So we started studying the vagus nerve in, in your physical body um, for panic and post-traumatic stress. Because if you breathe, like a yoga breath, they call it. So you breathe into the count of four and then you breathe out to much longer, like four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, as as far out as you can breathe. An extended out breath calms the nerve. So we started teaching people this that you you in panic or you pull over on the side of the road and you can start to breathe and calm yourself down. Okay, well that's great. But when you leave your body in a near death or an out of body experience, or when you die, how do you leave it? How do you get from here to there? Well, you have two bodies. St. Paul said that in the Bible, that you came in on the physical and you leave on the spiritual. So I have uh, found out from a lot of research, and I don't have this, you know, <laughs> uh, 
you know, very black and white down, but I can tell you that you start to, your body starts to turn counterclockwise and when it's time for you to leave. And when do you know when it's time for you to leave to have an out of body? Well, your soul decides that. Your soul is in charge of whatever spiritual experience you're going to have. And people, uh, 40 to 50% of the population in America and, the, and Great Britain are having these experiences. The seeing a de deceased loved one, you know, in your bedroom or leaving your body and um, seeing the light and uh, or just leaving your body and coming back in and then being afraid. Oh, I'd like to do that again, but how do I get back in? Well, how you get back in is you just think I want to be back in and that's how you get back in. And that's how it is on the other side. They can't talk over there, but they think. So they send us thoughts and they, they think. So you walk around up there. No, you can't be two-faced because everybody can read what you're thinking, um, which should maybe help you straighten out your life here. So when you go up there, you know, you're a little bit more just, you know, one way, not two-faced. Um I don't know if I answered your question. Uh, also, how do I know? I have um, I have, have three girls and my oldest daughter is on the other side. And so um, with the work that I've done with mediums, um, the mediums have, she has come in and contacted the medium and we've had some conversations, which have been very nice. Your first contact with someone or something on the other side happened when? Oh, well, it didn't start out like that. It started out, I lived in California. So when you live in California, uh, they have psychic fairs every weekend. At least they did when I was there. And um, and and so you go to psychics and it's just a lot of fun. And uh, sometimes what they say happens and comes true. And so then you go more. Um, and so I didn't start like going to mediums, talking to dead people. I just wanted, you know, to know all kinds of things like, should I go back to school? Should I do this? What's going to happen to my kid that's acting out? That kind of stuff. Um, but then when when I became a therapist and somebody said, you should really read Carl Jung because you like the paranormal and all this stuff. And he was really into it. Um, and then when I found a psychology and then William James was um, uh, developing mediums in at Harvard and nobody said this. I mean, he and his wife lost a toddler child. And so Mrs. James wanted to know where was her child. So she went to mediums and she dragged him along. And then he started studying mediums at the um, uh, Massachusetts General. Um, so you learn all that. And then you think, well, there's something here. And then you go to Lilydale, which is a town by, La by Lake Erie, where mediums live, or Casadega in Florida, where they live um, in the winter. And you, you go to a lot of mediums and you get messages. And so there is another side. And then you read all this 200 years of research that we have uh, through other mediums and different people that have talked to the deceased. It's, I mean, it's all there if you're looking for it. Have you ever met God, talked to God, and had a response? No. Mm -mm. The way I understand it on the other side, there's like seven layers there of heaven if that's what you want to call it. I call it the etheric world. And so you you have to you have to evolve to a point where you're not really talking to anybody on earth in order to get close enough to God. The idea that we are all one day going to have this happen. How do we get in touch with our spiritual side? in order to be prepared because for a lot of people we're not prepared to go at any time, whether it's sickness, health or age or, or whatever it may be. Well, I think um, it helps to have a positive attitude and it helps to be curious and it helps to ask the question, somebody up there, Help me learn what it is I need to learn so that I'm not afraid when my time comes. And as people get closer to death, you know, people in hospice many times, um, you know, have some kind of a spiritual awakening where they, they realize that there is another side. And while many times in hospice, they look up, it's always the right hand corner. I don't know why that is. And they see, you know, grandpa's there or somebody's there telling me, it's going to be okay. And they want me to, to follow them when it's time. 
Um, but you have to you have to open up yourself to some of the stories. Now we've got tons and tons of books of people who've had a near death or an out of body experience, and that's what happens to you when you die. Only when you leave the vagus nerve out of the top of your head, there's a silver cord that connects you. And they say when uh, they come back after their near death, something pulls them in. Well, if you were going to die, that silver cord stops vibrating and you don't get pulled back in. You just go um, and you go up. But you have to, you, number one, you have to um, have a positive attitude that there is something higher than you. And um, and really search for that, that if you don't believe it, um, talk to somebody, talk to a priest, talk to a therapist. Um, there are a lot of therapists that um, are holistic. Um, talk to a Jungian therapist. Um, somehow get some knowledge that will help you overcome your fear. We have three minutes to go before we got to go to break at the bottom of the hour. Reverend Karen Herrick is our guest tonight talking about death, near death experiences, out of body experiences, and so much more tonight. Reverend Karen, I, I'm curious in, in regards to, to the, the death factor and the way we all handle it. You know, everybody handles death uh, differently. Some people cry, some people grieve, some people get mad, some people, you know, have no problem moving on from, you know, saying, hey, that's just the way life is. The human emotion is a big part of this all. How are the emotions so, so what's the word I'm looking for? How are the emotions really affecting how people uh, uh, accept the next purpose in life, which is death. Well, let's take somebody who has had uncle Charlie die, right? Um, I've had people come to me and they're in such chronic grief. Number one, they can't believe where Charlie is and they don't want to go wherever Charlie went. Um, so many times what I do is I encourage them to go to a medium and sometimes it takes a lot of months to do that. But if they're in chronic grief and depression and talking to me for months hasn't helped them, then we have to do something else. So I would encourage them to do that, to find out if there is a spirit on the other side that can prove he's Uncle Charlie. And then when they come back, they're like, their whole body is different. And yes, he came through. Yes, the medium told me this and this and this and, um, you know, got proof that it was Charlie. And um, wow. And they're an entirely different person because they've gone to a medium. So I would highly recommend that if they're because many people that are in chronic grief are feeling guilt. Like maybe they did something, uh, you know, that caused Charlie not to live as long as he could have or um, what they did to Charlie while he was here. and no amount of talking seems to alleviate that guilt other than having Charlie say, it's okay. It was my time to go. It's not your fault. So I believe in mediumship and using it as a um, adjunct to therapy. We got 30 seconds to go in. And you, when did you start believing in the whole psychic thing? I can't give you a certain date. I think it was an accumulation and, I think I've probably believed for like now 20, 25 years. It's kind of weird when somebody you don't know can start picking out things in your life that they would never, ever know. Right. That's right. It's just amazing. Amazing how it works. And some people are, are so talented with that. Uh, Reverend Karen, I'm going to get you to hold on right there because we are going to go to break here at the bottom of the hour here on Spaced Out Radio. And when we return, we're going to get into near-death experiences. What are they like? What are they all about? What's this silver umbilical cord that stretches up to where a random guy has aliens? We're going to get going with Reverend Karen Herrick on Spaced Out Radio. You can pick up her brand new book on Amazon. We'll be right back. I ran out of time to mention your book's name. I'm sorry. It's all right. I feel bad. Don't feel bad. 
<laughs> I feel bad. I feel good, but I feel bad. Hold on. Let me get it here. Oh. Let's see here. Lily Pond, how are you? Parasolo, how are you? Max Stacks, how are you? Pixie Lara, how are you? Random Gee, got aliens. Yep. And... Uh, Let's see who else has come on in here. Ah, we're caught up now. There we go. Noodles, what's happening? Hey, thank you, buddy. Appreciate that. Are you having fun yet, Reverend Karen? Yes. Excellent. Excellent. I'd like to talk about... Um... Uh, the three modes of um, the sensory reality, the clairvoyant reality, and the transpsychic reality. So they maybe can understand that a little bit. Let's do it. Anything Reverend Karen wants tonight, she's going to get. <laughs> Terry Gomez, welcome to SOR chat. Thank you for joining us. We get to go wherever you want. And that beautiful Tiffany blue jacket that you have on thank you i like this color me too me too Nicole agrees in our chat room with the jacket. She likes the jacket. <laughs> Thank you, Nicole. She says, me three. One second here. Kathleen Hughes, how are you? Eva, good to have you here, Eva. We have about two minutes, my friend. Two minutes. My jaw is killing me now. Next break, I'm going to have to go get some painkillers. I had a, a couple weeks ago, I had a filling done on the last tooth on the bottom right right and uh it was they didn't grind it down enough so i had to go back to the dentist yesterday to get it ground down and because of uh my jaw being or my tooth being higher than the rest it was causing a lot of pressure on my jaw which made my jaw bruise oh. and so now that they had they cut the tooth on down and grind it on down now it's going to be like that for a couple more days. Oh. Mm -hmm. Sounds uncomfortable. Yeah, very, very. My cousin, he's like, cheap Canadian health care. <laughs> yeah. I, I dislike Dennis. <laughs> yep. But they're necessary. Mm -hmm. This is a guy who hides... He's a Canadian who hides in the U.S. by waving an American flag. Yeah. USA, USA. Gotta love him. He's my favorite cousin. Favorite cousin. He looks like Bob Vila. 
I don't know if that's a compliment or not, but he's got the beard of Bob Vila. Guy can make a a bird bath in no time. Uh, thank you, W. David Page, Louie, and Mark for the awesome super chats tonight. Very much appreciate the love and support. And our website, spacedoutradio.com, for our swag. Don't forget, you have until tomorrow at midnight to get your VIP tickets for Vegas. Here we go. Second half hour of Space Down Radio is now underway. Good to have you with us. My name is Dave Scott. Very much appreciate earning your listening ears. Want to remind you that if you've missed portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the newswire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. We continue on tonight with Reverend Karen Herrick. She's got a brand new book out. You're not finished yet. Deals with life after death, near-death experiences, and all the woo you can handle in the afterlife. Reverend Karen, welcome back. Thank you. And it's... um. You're not finished yet handles living in an alcoholic home or dysfunctional home. Um, The one about near death experiences is um, psychology of the soul and the paranormal. Man, I, uh, I thank you for updating me on that because. Okay. Okay, Let's move on. Okay. Let us move on. All right. Near death experiences. A lot of people have them. Uh, I've never had one out of all the weird, strange stuff that's happened to me. Uh, they scare the daylights out of me, just the thought of them, but they're pretty cool. The people who have them usually are very, very down to earth about it. No pun intended. (laughs) What are they all about? Well, the soul leaves the body, um, and is still connected to the body. So it still gets oxygen. The etheric body goes up. And, you know, flies around up there. Some of them see their grandmother. Some of them see flowers and music. And um, on my um, website, I have an interview with a gal who uh, was in labor for her first child. And she was she had a left her body. And she was up there and all this beautiful music and flowers. And then she could look down below and see her physical body in labor. And I said, well, yeah. So you were up in your spiritual body and you were watching your physical body. And she said, yeah, and the next two deliveries didn't happen like that. And I said, well, you're lucky you got the first one because that's the hardest one. But um, so that's what happens. You you leave your physical body and you realize there's something bigger than you. Absolutely. Um, and you, they come back. And the thing about coming back, though, um, they sometimes they wait seven years before they tell you they had a near-death experience because they're so afraid of of being called crazy and also their families don't want to hear it anymore you have to stop talking about that um i don't want to hear it i don't believe it so 79 percent of people who had a near death divorce usually after the after the near death and um and then they wait a long time before um you know they could they come and tell someone which is one of the reasons on webinars that i i teach about this because Therapists need to be able to validate these experiences, even if they've never had one, so that they can understand them. But when they come back, all of them seem to want better relationships in their life. They don't know how they're going to get that, but they want meaningful relationships. Okay. So the people who have them, what would cause a near-death experience? I mean, we can all say like a car accident or a heart attack or stroke, but is that namely when it happens or is it happening at any time? It happens at any time. But like I said, the people that are having them with a stroke or on the cardiac table or in a car accident are the people that are able to disassociate faster because they've lived in traumatic homes. So people that have lived in a dysfunctional home will have those experiences easier than someone who did not. 
But I believe it's your soul that determines when and, you know, what kind of spiritual experience you're going to have. Uh, for instance, I felt a breath come into my body, which took me about a year and a half to figure out it was the Holy Spirit. And um, my father was Protestant. My mother was Catholic. So there was always this, you know, dissension in our house. Not that it was talked about. It was just felt. And um, so I had a spiritual experience that taught me about the Holy Spirit. Well, that could be for either religion. So that was great for me. But that's the one I needed for some reason. So everyone's going to have a different type. And, and you know, they you don't just have a near death or out of body. You can have um, telepathy, you know, uh, where you hear a voice. Lots of people hear their names called. And they think that's going to make them feel crazy. And that makes them feel crazy, but they're not. Lots of times they just hear their name being called. Um, so anything that, now that would be, be scary. But a spiritual experience should humble you, should make your heart and your, you know, your mind and your heart are kind of together and feeling like something really beautiful happened. So how, how does it happen? Um, where you and I are talking um, in the sensory reality, there's past, present, and future where we are right here, material world. Okay. Then there's the clairvoyant world. Um, and in the clairvoyant world is where you have spiritual experiences or um, you see your deceased mother in your bedroom at night. Or it's you're, you're in the now completely in the now. And they say it, when you have a near death, that's where you are too. It's just the most wonderful feeling in the world that you're in this now you feel in your heart that something special has just happened and you're humbled by it when you come back. The people who have it, is there a difference between say somebody in their seventies who has a near death experience and say a child who's, you know, between well, zero and 20 years old, is there a difference in what they experience? Well, the child, a PMH Atwater is, is the expert on that. And children don't don't even know what happened to them until they're an adult and they start talking to somebody about it. Children just think that everybody has it happen, but they don't talk. Of, they start to talk about it. And then somebody says, no, you didn't see that or you didn't see Christ or no. What are you talking about? So the kid doesn't doesn't tell you anymore. And there haven't been any studies about, you know, if a 25 year old has one or a 70 year old has one that I know of. Really? Yeah, because you would think due to the lack of experience of life or the begin near the beginning of life where you still have that spiritual connection with the other side that you would see something a little bit different. The characteristics are pretty much the same. You go through a dark tunnel, which I believe is the vagus nerve. You come out and you see the light um, and you feel, you know, tremendous joy and love and um there's, you know, Raymond Moody in 1975, he had 11 characteristics of people who had had a near-death experience. And pretty much they stayed the same. For people who know they are close to death, we often hear of these stories of hearing they, they're talking to people who've already passed on at other times, whether it's a mother, father, grandpa, grandma, whatever it may be. I mean, are they connecting their spirit source back to the other side when that happens? Yes, they are. Because love is the greatest energy of all. And so our loved ones want us back with them and they want us to know it's safe to come. And no religion teaches you this, which, excuse me, I think that would be a great thing to start. That They say that's why a lot of people, when they pass over, they don't realize they're dead. Because on the other side, the first level looks pretty much like it does here, um, from what I've read. And so they don't know they died because nobody prepares them for what happens. Okay. So when people have a near-death experience, what are they usually seeing or having have happen? They usually um, see, see the light. They talk about that and how wonderful it is. Um, and then they hear music that's beautiful. They see flowers. They say the colors are just absolutely phenomenal over there. A very peaceful. Um, some people have 
there was a, a lady that went to the Akashic Records. Have you ever heard of the Akashic Records? Yes. Yes. Okay. So she went there and it's and this big library and pulled out the drawers and saw, you know, different people's files and anybody could go there. They said, <laughs> if you have a near, if you have a near death or an out of body. Um, so there's all kinds of stories of people that when they come back, they have a little bit different that for them, what they needed, but it's always the light and the music and, and, um, and you know, their grandmother or somebody that meant something to them and, uh, and told them it's not your time, go back. And it seems to be that they, they need to be able to come back and really live their life. These people that are had near death, they're happy. They're not afraid to die because they've already been there and come back. Okay. Uh, I, I ha See, for somebody who has anxiety with this subject, I have a, a real tough time understanding that, you know, somebody can't wait to die again. I mean, that just blows my mind. Because, because you're in the clairvoyant reality where there is a God. And you do feel this wonderful spiritual feeling and your heart knows it's real. So you have to have faith that that could happen. See, this is where I struggle and many people struggle because there's too many what ifs out there. Let's say, what, what if, what if, science is right and religion or the belief in God is all fallacy. This well, is what keeps me up at night. Science, um, as we know it, is not what we should be doing to study this. We should be using clairvoyant mediums or psychics to study what happens when, because they can see the soul leaving the body. They can tell you what it looks like in the vagus nerve. And um, our science just, you can't, you take something in the clairvoyant reality that happens, it usually happens to one person, right? If I'm going to have a near death, I have it by myself, right? And so that I come back and I have characteristics that I can tell you about, but, but that's it. We can't do that in a lab again. And my deceased mother is not going to come to me in a laboratory. I guarantee you, because it's just not loving. The atmosphere of the clairvoyant world is that you're connecting with love. And so our science isn't going to work. We need a new science. And there's the Bix Institute in Las Vegas. Have you heard about that? No. Because you're going to go to Las Vegas. That's interesting. Um, the Bigelow Institute um, of Consciousness yeah. Studies. And he um, had a contest, right? And he wanted people um, in 2021, I think, um, he advertised in the New York Times um, that he was going to um, pay over a million dollars for researchers who believed in the paranormal um, to give him proof of immortality, life after death, that would stand up in a court of law. So that's easier than science. And so 1,200 people applied. And you had to have at least five years of experience in the paranormal department. And um, 1,200 people applied and 204 people in nine months wrote a paper for him. And he gave between a million and, and $2 million uh, to 29 winners uh, who had stories like what I'm telling you about near death. One guy uh, was Jewish and he was like 25 years old. The guy who he won 500,000 for the first prize. And um, he just had a dream one night and he started singing this Jewish death song in his dream. The, and he, he didn't know Hebrew, but that's what he was singing, right? Because uncle, not Charlie, but <clears throat> an uncle had died and he, in his dream, was singing this death chant for his uncle. And he's never forgotten that. That is what he, he used as proof that there is um, life after death, um, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not explaining each one, but um, they're wonderful. You can download all these papers off of BICS. Um, uh, 
Bigelow Institute of Consciousness Studies.com. And um, you could read them. And they're still studying now. They're looking for wisdom that comes from the other side. And I would I would assume that's through mediumship. Yeah. Now that you mentioned Robert Bigelow, I, I totally understand uh, the study that you were talking about. Uh, Terry Lovelace, a UFO uh, uh, guy, He, I believe he won second place on that. Uh, if our chat room can correct me if I'm wrong, I would appreciate that. But the the study of it goes though, and and Robert Bigelow has had a long history with trying to solve the paranormal and supernatural, and has put in millions upon millions of his own. Uh, or probably Nick Cook won second place. I apologize. Thank you. Um, he put in millions upon millions of his own dollars to try and solve this mystery and the the reason that uh, allegedly behind it is because he's still grieving the loss of his son okay. who passed away a number of years ago and he would love anything more to than reconnect with his son right and and the idea behind that is how do we know that you know our own grief isn't leading our imagination down a wild ride Well, you see, <laughs> you have to suspend that disbelief and negative thinking if you're going to go to a medium and get a message, right? Usually the people that get a message, there's some kind of proof in there that nobody would know. It's never been on Google. Nobody's told a story before. And so you have a heart connection because you really know that that is the person that you love that's on the other side. And you know it's still them. Right. But the, but the negative thinking would stop you from having a really good medium visit, I believe. Right. I've been to a number of mediums. I've been to very good ones, and I've been to some horrific ones. Okay. Yes. And, but I will say that there's a couple out there that I've been to who can absolutely read me like a book. Wonderful. And <laughs> and that hasn't helped you? Uh you know what you know what doesn't help me is being a journalist for the last quarter century. I have a lot of questions. Okay. And when the media when the reading stops and then I go back and review, I have more questions. Okay. You know. So I mean, so you that's have to have another visit. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. So, I mean, the idea behind it is, though, is you is you really have to trust. But I mean, I'm also watching. Are are they watching my reaction? Are they watching my body language? Are they watching to see how I react or my body reacts to certain answers or questions? You know, some ask very vague questions. Others, uh, others don't. Well, that's why you, you only go to a medium that you can trust, which takes time to find, just like a good therapist sometimes takes time to find. Oh, very true. Very true. And, you know, so for people out there searching for a good psychic medium, what should they be looking for? Oh, well, they should be looking for someone that really gives them the connection and know that it's dad or it's your daughter or it's somebody that you really wanted to talk to. And most mediums will say to you, well, bring a picture of the person you want, you want to um, come in. Right. Well, that's fine. You can bring a picture and that probably helps the intention of who you want to talk to, but we can't, we can't say if you want to talk to your mom, that your deceased mom is going to come in. There's no guarantee of that because the spirits are up there waiting to jump in and you know it could be uncle charlie that wants to come in and your mom's not coming because he gets in first however even if it's uncle charlie he ought to be saying something that makes you feel good that you've had a visit with him i understand that and you know uh I've had experiences myself where, where I know that this can be something that is very personal for a lot of people. 
Yes. Uh, whether it's near ex- death experience, out of body experience, astral travel, remote viewing, connection. I've channeled uh, certain things. And when you get into that zone where you are connected fully to the other side, it's very heavy on the body. It is very heavy. Uh, the amount of energy transfer between the spirit and yourself, whether it's a psychic reading or whether it's not. Yes. It's a different vibration. Do you do readings on your own? No, I don't. I'm not a medium. I'm a therapist who believes in mediums and, and I have good intuition of course, but um, you know, what helps too is synchronicities. Have you ever had synchronicities? I think we all have. Okay. Well, that really helps. And I think that helped me more than anything, get to know, well, where is this coming from? There's the fact that, you know, um, I can go on a plane ride and I'm reading a book about the golden rule. And um, I get to Arkansas to talk to Raymond Moody and um, this uh, Alamo driver says to me, Oh, you know what? There's a good restaurant where you're going. And it's, um, you know, down by Raymond's house, it's called the golden rule. I mean, you see the synchronicity of that, me reading an article on the airplane and then boom, tells me I'm on the right path. And Carl Jung really believed in synchronicities. What's a cool synchronicity you've had? Oh, the coolest one? Oh, gosh, I don't know. Let me tell you the one about Jung and then maybe one of mine will come in. But um, Jung had this client a year and a half and she wasn't really doing a lot. But anyway, she comes in one day and she had this dream about this black bug, right? So um, he taken notes and everything, and it's June in Switzerland. It's hot. So he opens the window, lets some air in, and this black bug flies in and lands on the carpet. And she goes, that's it. That's the bug that was in my dream. And he goes, okay, okay. And now that would have been great, right? She dreamed it, and it came the next day to her. But it was a scarab bug from Egypt, and it was alive. Oh, my. I know. So that's a pretty good synchronicity. So that's when he said, we all have to pay attention. Now, you know, normally we get the kind that we lose a job and we're in the post office on Wednesday at 9 o'clock, and we meet somebody from second grade, and they have a job for us. So that's our synchronicities. We don't see black bugs usually. Uh, But whatever it is that connects, there's a reason for that. And that comes from the spirit world too. And then prayer, people that, you know, Bill Wilson, the the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, got on his knees when his doctor told him after 22 years, the next time you come back here to to dry out, we're going to put you in a mental hospital. And his whole thing was he wasn't going to mental hospital. So he got on his knees that night and prayed to God, if there is a God, please take away my desire to drink. And this room filled up with light and this air came through him and he just felt so calm and his desire to drink was gone. Then the next morning he starts thinking negatively, right? Well, I've hallucinated. So maybe it was a hallucination. So his doctor comes in later and he tells him and he doctor says, well, look, I'm a doctor. I don't know about that stuff, but whatever happened to you last night, I'd stick with it because you look better today than you've ever looked before. And then his friend, Ebby came and Ebby had been in mental hospitals, but Ebby was reading William James's book, The Variety of Religious Experience. And he said to Bill Wilson, you had a re- religious experience. So he started reading that. So that's one of the tw- 12 steps of AA. I think it's the 11th step that you can have a spiritual experience. On that note, I'm going to get you to hold on right there because we are going to go to break here at the top of the hour. And... Our guest tonight, Reverend Karen Herrick, is with us. We are talking near-death experiences, what it's like on the other side, how do we connect. Then she's also giving us a good butt-whipping that we don't need to be afraid about dying because there's more out there than what we realize. It's kind of a cool thought now, isn't it? Spaced Out Radio's hour number two with Reverend Karen Herrick. Coming up right after this. Stay tuned.
All right, we are clear. That's kind of fun. That is kind of fun. I'm going to put you back in the green room. I'm going to step away for a quick break here. We got about six minutes, okay? Okay. Six minutes, and I'll be right back. Okay. Right back. Don't miss me too much, because I'll be right back. <coughs> Hi, Marlena. How are you? Let's see who else has shown up here. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jules, for putting that up for us. Hello, Rev. How are you? I am good. I have a good um, telepathy story that I had happen to me. I think it's better than any synchronicity I've, I've had. 
Oh, we're going to get into telepathy. I love telepathy. <laughs> In fact, I'm sending telepathy to our friend random guy right now, reminding him that he's got aliens. Kevin Kingsmore, thank you, my man. That's right. I am Pam, everybody. I am Pam. Susie B, how you doing? Finishing off the remnants of a cream soda slushy. <laughs> Nothing better than a cream soda slushy. Warm. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's above freezing, so I can I can have a slushy now. We got about 30 seconds. Thank you to W. David Page, Louie, Mark, and Greg for the amazing super chats. Very much appreciate earning your trust and love. Very much appreciate it. And everyone, here we go with the next hour. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook, Spaced Out Radio Show. Hour number two of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We very much appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on Odyssey Radio, Talk Stream Live, KPNL. All of our archives are free. Join us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Oast. Oast is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as the clams. It's a password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bubblefoot, read the newswire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. Here we go with Reverend Karen E. Herrick. We are talking about the riddles of death. Yeah, near-death experiences, what people experience, and much more that surrounds the subject. Reverend Karen, welcome back. Thank you. Got to ask you about the three modes of reality. Yes. This, this was something that you wanted to tackle. What are they all about? Well, the sensory reality, we, I started with that. Um, is that what we're in right now? You know, past, present, future, right here. Whatever we see, um, we can agree on. And then the second one is a clairvoyant reality where you have telepathy, where you have uh, prayer, contemplation, um, near death, all these different kinds of spiritual things that happen to you. And um, you know something is greater than you. And you are. they say you're in the now. And I can't explain it other than it is a head-heart connection where you are really feeling what's happening to you and it really makes an, an effect. So it's some kind of transcendent reality that you're in. And sometimes there's an angel or, you know, um, some other kind of transcendent symbol uh, there with you, or else you just have this feeling of love and contentment. And then there's a trans psychic reality and that's where miracles happen. And, and many doctors, the last study that I read about that said 55% of doctors said that miracles happen every day. Really? Yeah. That is incredible. It is, isn't that, it? That is incredible. I mean, when you talk to medical doctors about some of the things that they have experienced, whether it's you know, people in the operating room who they are working on who are clinically dead and that person comes back and and states, hey, I was I was watching you guys work on me. And by the way, that's a nice set of earrings that you're wearing or something along those lines. I mean, how are doctors who 
who are, you know, the ultimate heroes of humanity, how are they reacting to this near-death saga? Well, um, some of them believe it and some of them don't. And in fact, since 1975, we've had this term near death that Raymond Moody um, created uh, and they didn't believe it for a while. They, But now there's a lot more holistic doctors that, that do believe in it. Um, like, you know, like anyone else, the good and the bad of, you know, some doctors are with spirituality and some doctors aren't. But most of them that well, that I've talked to anyway, but then it's because I'm talking to them about spirituality. Um, I would say that the, the tide has really turned and many, especially with Eben Alexander, you know, the yes. doctor that had his near death experience, you know, they have somebody that they, you know, really listen to and can believe a Harvard graduate. And also there's um, Netflix has this wonderful uh, spiritual, what is it called? Uh, surviving death. It's about two years old, and they have five different stories on that uh, special. You can just get on for free. And the first one is on near-death experiences, and it's all PhDs that have had near-death experiences. And that's what Bigelow's is, too. It's all PhDs. So that's great. But what I wanted, I want to tell people is, guess what? Normal people are having them, too. You don't have to be a PhD to have one. But, you know, I do think that they're coming around. Okay. All right. Uh, so the idea that these are, are happening in operating rooms and in, and in hospices and everything along those lines, I look at my mother, my mother is like a cat who has nine lives. Okay. And she has been on the doorstep of death numerous times. Uh, most recently in October where we were uh, all called down. And basically told, you know, they might, you might want to come say goodbye. And the weird part about that was my, my son, who is nine, we were the last ones to arrive. And my son goes running into the room, jumps on my mom's bed. Hi, grandma. I missed you. And now my mom is Back. almost uh, way better. <laughs> she is. Way better. She's in. She's in a nursing home now, right. but but from that moment forward, her progress. It was almost like she she told herself physically, or told whoever physically, yeah, I'm not doing this for my grandson right now. Not doing that. Yeah. See, love is the greatest energy. That's what Eben Alexander said, right? He was he was twenty percent only alive when his son got on the bed and said. Dad, dad, you have to come back. And he came back. Yeah, and he works, I believe he works at John Hopkins, doesn't he? Johns I'm not Hopkins. sure. I'm not sure now. So, yeah. You know, I mean, but it's just, it's amazing that the power of it. And, you know, other people have been given messages over time regarding you know, their own health, whether it's not time yet. I remember my grandfather, a very, very strict Haldeman Mennonite. He used to own a, a funeral home. And during one of his two near-death experiences, during uh, he had about seven or eight strokes before he finally uh, decided it was time to go home. And I I remember my him telling my mom that, you know, because he owned a funeral home, he said like during his near death experience, he went down to the mortuary in the hospital. And as the elevator doors open, all the walls went completely white and all of his relatives, his brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, mom, and dad were all on the other side. And here he was trying to unlock the doors to go and see them. And they, they kept on saying, no, it's not your time yet. No, it, you can't come in. And he was screaming and yelling and crying at them. And the next one he had was after my grandmother had passed away. And my grandmother was now behind that glass wall. And he was screaming at my grandmother, bawling her eyes, his eyes out. I want to be with you, Dorothy. I want to, you know, let's, let's do this. And, and it, it, my grandma apparently was telling him, no, you can't come home yet. Right. Right. 
And, you know, I believe my grandfather because my grandfather never lied a day in his life. You know, he was, he was right. a, a very God fearing man. You know, he never listened to the radio. He, you know, he just, he was just a great, great man, great, great man. And so, I mean, then all of a sudden when he passes away, all I could think about was, man, he got the key to the door. <laughs> That's right. It was his time. <laughs> And he'll be there when you pass over. I know. <laughs> That's what's nice. See what I, I try not to make the show about my experiences because I have over the last 11 years, 12 years, oh geez, 12 years now had a plethora of things happen. I've met with the angel of death twice. Wow, good for you. And um, I felt the hand of God. I have, um, when my nephew passed away, yesterday would have been my nephew's 34th birthday, I astral traveled to see him on the other side to make sure he was okay. And my grandparents, my, my two grandfathers who passed away, and my grandmother, whom he never met, uh, they were all there with it. So I, I'm like this walking contradiction of having this ultimate fear of death, but yet I've experienced so much where I know personally that there is something more to it. Yes. Okay, good. Yeah. So you just have to ask for a more positive attitude. Tell me how I can have a more positive attitude every day. Clarity. I think it's more clarity. Okay. And what would you need to make it more clear? <laughs> a near-death experience. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> the exact thing I don't want. <laughs> well, I would just read about a lot of them then. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's why I have people like you come on the radio show in order to uh, freak me out a little bit. So, you know, gets my heart pumping again. <laughs> totally gets my heart pumping, but that's okay. That That's very much okay. Telepathy. I am absolutely fascinated with telepathy. And I am very much convinced that whether it's angels, whether it's aliens, whether it's Bigfoot or what it, any type of animal like a dog or a cat, I believe they're all telepathic. Okay. And we as humans have forgotten the power of our mind in order to do it. Yes. Well, Which, I also believe spirits, spirits help us with telepathy. Do you want me to tell you my story? I would love to hear your telepathic story. <laughs> okay. So I have this 53 pound poodle. Her name is Emma. And uh, <clears throat> let's see, this was years ago at Halloween. And I lived in a house that I had raised after hurricane Sandy. <clears throat> so it had a lot of stairs. And um, so it was Halloween and this whole bunch of adolescents were coming up the stairs. They had these hoodies on and the dog doesn't like hoodies. So she was barking like crazy. And I said, please take your, your hoodies off. And um, I had a bowl of chocolate bars. So I opened the door and I said, here, take it, you know, take whatever you want. And then Emma stuck her nose in, in the bowl, just smelled them. <clears throat> and then she backed away. And then um, a friend of mine dropped over later on in the evening and I had made a pie. So we had a piece of pie and some tea. And then we had another piece of pie and some tea. And um, so she leaves and uh, I get ready for bed. So I go in and brush my teeth. And um, I come out of the bathroom and there's 53 pound dog is just sitting there. And she does that sometimes. I say, excuse me. So she moves. So I go in the closet, get in my pajamas, come out. There she is. Excuse me. I go into the third bedroom to get my glasses so I can read. And I turn around and I almost fell on her. And so I got down like you would with a two-year-old to her level. And I said, 
I don't know what you're doing, but you're going to hurt me. If I fall on you, I'm going to hurt me and I'm going to hurt you. What is your problem? And the voice I heard said, everybody got something but me. And I thought, but you're a dog. <laughs> you know. So I gave her a treat and she went to bed. Now, <laughs> the what they say about telepathy is you have to have a very loving connection to have something like that happen. And but that was meaningful to me because I was much kinder to Emma after that. And, you know, she gets fed first when people are coming and she always gets a treat when we get dessert. So she really taught me something. Um, but I couldn't believe I heard that voice. Man, man. I mean, hearing your dog speak to you. I know. <laughs> I mean, did you question your own sanity? Well, people are going to start writing into you now. <laughs> um, no. No. Because I've read a lot. I mean, telepathy has been proven. You know, they did that at Duke University. So um, it can never have It's a one-time thing, just like a spiritual experience. We cannot recreate it. It happens because of the love or connection between the two people. And, and Emma apparently believed if she showed me enough, I would pay attention to her, which I did. So I was glad that she had enough faith to keep doing that. Where do you think we've lost the talents as humans to telepathically communicate with each other? Well, it's just we're too busy. It's too noisy. And we don't we don't take time to, you know, it's like like what they said when I did holotropic breath work. Don't think, just breathe. Well, so you have to have times when you're not thinking, when your mind is clear, you know, garden or walk the dog or go out for a walk or meditate, um, read spiritual material, just sit and be quiet. And then I think you could hear a lot of things. Hmm. What would you like to telepathically communicate with? Oh, I don't really have anything that I want to do that with, I don't think. So I don't have a need to do that. There's a lot of people out there who believe that whether it's animals or creatures like Bigfoot, they have what they call mind speak, where they can speak to you. Right. I can give you, I can give you an example of this. Okay. And last year we went into an area where we are kind of investigating Sasquatch. Okay. And eventually we saw the creature back in October. And that was kind of a whole different sort of awesome. Prior to that, a few weeks prior, we drove up to the area. And from the minute we turned on that logging road, it was the feeling of absolute fear and terror. All of us had it. They're just, there was something wrong. Um, two people who were with me were feeling very heavy. They were feeling very uh, down. They were getting headaches. I was the one driving. I was getting pareidolia of the faces of alien beings in, in brush and trees and, and everything. And, you know, you drive by it. There's nothing there. It's just the shape of the branches. Right, right. We get to the spot, and this you have to understand, I live in an area where there is a lot of wild animals. Okay. Okay, grizzly bears, black bears, mountain lions, wolf packs, a lot of things that can kill you. Right. Okay, and they don't want you in their area. But right. nonetheless, we always go in armed. Not okay. for the Sasquatch, because that would be kind of a cool death. Okay. Uh, but if, uh, you know, in this situation, my friend Mark actually had this mind speak telepathy come to him. And it basically said, I wouldn't bring your gun out if I were you. Bad things will happen. 
Interesting. Yeah. And a lot of people who have encountered cryptids like Bigfoot or what they call Dogman have got a lot, especially with this Dogman creature, have got a lot of telepathic communication from people who are armed. And basically this creature has said to them, yeah, I wouldn't do that if I were you. And these people lower their arms and slowly back out of the area. Okay. So the fact that these creatures, whatever they may be, or even aliens, people have said that they, they've seen aliens right in front of them and they get a telepathic message. Don't worry. We're not going to harm you or don't worry. We're not going to be gone long or whatever it may be. These telepathic messages seem to be a way that triggers our minds into almost a cautious relaxation of the situation. Yes. A warning. Yeah. Can you explain that? No. <laughs> I can't explain it. <laughs> I have enough trouble trying to have people go to mediums <laughs> and understand their death experience. So no, that is not my area of expertise, but it sounds very interesting. I, I thought think, you would, uh, I think go ahead. there's negative energy, right? Um, and and if you're threatening and that, that area, right, with your guns, that there's going to be a lot of resistance to having you there. And negative energy is, is going to fill the, the area. And they're, they're trying to warn you maybe to keep you away. That would be my guess. But I do believe in negative energy. Do you think then that this telepathy we're not just making it up in our minds when we hear a cat talk to us or we hear an angel out of nowhere. Oh, or no, even... it's, it's happening. Yeah. Mysterious things happen every day. You know, we have a soul. Each one of us has a soul. That is the spiritual part of God. So we're human and we're spiritual. It's just that in our everyday society, there's too much going on and a lot of it is not good. And we don't, we don't work on the spiritual enough. Is that a newfound human trait? Like if we went back, say 100 years ago, would people be more open to telepathic message? Oh, I think so. Sure. Like the time of Christ, there were always people talking about the world coming to an end or prophets walking around talking about and they the people then could tell the difference between the crazy people and the prophets okay so how do we get back as a society oh. in order to be able to tell to communicate with our minds is this is where, where we're almost going to end up with ai <laughs> oh i don't know about that well, that's the big problem, isn't it, with our with our world, is how do we make our world more spiritual and less aggressive and stop wars and make people get along with each other? Seems to be the goal of the aliens, too. You think? It's okay. Never, well, that's your, your area of expertise. Oh, it tries to be the aliens there? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I just like saying the word aliens, to be honest. <laughs> But it's it's a lot of fun. We have about 30 seconds to go here before we're going to go to break at the bottom of the hour. And we say a big uh, thank you to all you tuning on in as we will have Reverend Karen Herrick here for another 30 minutes on Spaced Out Radio. So you don't think that we'll be able to get our telepathic communication back again as a human form of communication? Well, I think we'd have to get a group of people that wanted to do it, a large group of people. I think years ago, 10, 15 years ago in Washington, D.C., they had people that meditated. Um, Hold that thought. All right. Let's, let's talk about group contact. Right. When we return on Spaced Out Radio, Reverend Karen Herrick, we have her until the top of the hour here on the Mighty SLR. We'll be right back on Spaced Out Radio.
yeah, telepathy blows my mind. It, it really does blow my mind. It's very interesting. Oh, yeah. Still having fun? Yes. <laughs> I can't believe how wide awake I am. <laughs> ah, that's a good thing. Yes, it is. <laughs> that is a good thing. Being wide awake helps us out. <laughs> I have a friend of mine, Samantha Mowat, who it is so difficult for me to have a phone conversation with her because she literally finishes every sentence. Oh. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's the weirdest thing. That must be a nice yeah. connection, though. Well, it's funny because the day I met her will be nine years tomorrow. And 25 minutes after I met her, she walked me into a forest at two o'clock in the afternoon. And it was the first time I ever saw extraterrestrials. Oh, wow. That's great. Yeah. yeah. So 2 o'clock tomorrow in the afternoon, West Coast time, 5 p.m. Eastern, 6.30 in Newfoundland. It will be the nine-year anniversary of my uh, meeting of extraterrestrials in broad daylight. That's beautiful. And did you, yeah. get, a, did you get a message? Uh, I was way too stunned. Yeah. Uh, I was way too stunned and uh, I was way too naive. Uh, I was very much frozen. I wasn't scared of the being. I was afraid of everything that I had learned up until that moment was now wrong. Ah. Uh. And that's what hit me. And I froze. They invited us over to say hello. <laughs> I, I chickened out and I begged Samantha to stay with me. Okay. Yeah. It is scary they, when you have, um, you know, a spiritual experience or experience with something like that, a different kind of a being. It's very scary, this um, spiritual experience and stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because you're in another realm. Oh, yeah. And, and we're not used to that, right? Very true. Our, whoever taught us that we could do this? Not a lot of people. <clears throat> I agree. I totally agree. All right. Thank you to Vaughn Patrick, Louie times two, Greg, Mark, and W. David Page for the awesome Super Chats tonight. Super Chats are a wonderful way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. So thank you so, so much. Very much appreciate the love. And you only have until midnight tomorrow night to get your VIP tickets for our second annual Las Vegas SOR fan party at the Golden Nugget. May 19th through 21st. We got about, as far as I know, we got about 50 people coming. Still a bunch saying they're on the fence, but they are hopefully going to be there. Working some things out. And we want to see you all there. We want to see you all there as many as possible because it's going to be a great time. And we got some great, great fun speakers coming out to hang out with you that you would recognize from the show, from Merle to Science Bob to Bigfoot Rob, to Melinda Leslie, Lorian Fenton, Geraldina Roscoe, Random Gee and his new aliens are going to be there. Yep, we got it all happening. So go to spacedoutradionetwork at gmail.com. If you haven't heard from us, 
don't panic. We will get everything organized and uh, we'll see you in Vegas very, very soon. Our store is open at spacedoutradio.com. So make sure you check that on out as well and get your swag. Yeah, get your swag. We have 10 seconds before we're going to get going here. If you have questions, put them in capital letters for this next half hour. I'll get them to Reverend Karen. Here we go, everyone. We pass the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. Thank you so much for tuning us on in. We very much appreciate it. I want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the news wire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. For the final time here tonight, Reverend Karen E. Herrick is with us talking about near death, telepathy, and all the weird stuff that is psychic intuition as well. We will get to some audience questions here momentarily. But Reverend Karen, you know, you are a big proponent of of psychic intuition getting people to get readings and and take the time to find out what the spirits are saying to you and uh, you know maybe pointing you into the future a lot of times my complaint with psychic people is this they have a great great accuracy of detecting a lot of bad things the most of them But when it comes to good things, everything always seems to be three, four, five, six, eight, ten, twelve 10, 12 months away. And then when you finally get to that three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve 10, 12 months away and nothing happens, they say, well, we were in Mercury retrograde or, or Jupiter wasn't aligning with Saturn and Venus decided to be a, a little bit of a, of a weirdo and do some cat calling on Mars and it all seemed to go to hell. So, I mean, I can sense people's frustrations with psychic mediums regarding that. How do you deal with that? Well, number one, I don't think that psychics or mediums uh, are good at, at telling you about time because they they're getting the information from a place that has no time. So I just never have believed that um, or put a lot of stock into that. If I want something about time, I'll go to an astrologer and have my chart read, which I've done for 25 years, once a year. And I have my natal chart read and, um, and they tell you all kinds of things that are going to happen in three months, three and a half months, or April 4th, or whatever it is. I write it all down in my appointment book, and I forget about it. And then I come upon, oh, you were supposed to have trouble with money here with a woman, and sometimes it happens. Uh, so I find that I have more accuracy with astrology in that area. But- all right, this leads to Jules' question. Is there any surefire way to spot a charlatan psychic or medium? I think it's just the feeling you get that they're real. So your intuition. So you have to learn how to trust your intuition. Um, But like you said, the ones that ask very vague questions um, and are kind of hunting for, um, um, you know, you had a death recently. Well, that doesn't tell you anything. You know, any one of us could have had a death recently. So it would be better to, you know, if they had said, you know, you lost your father. Um, So in the first 15 minutes of a session, you should get an idea of whether this person is really on to you or whether it's they're kind of vague and kind of playing around with you. Okay, let's move on to another question from our audience here. Uh, Let's go to Lucien, who is asking, are you familiar with Santeria? What's your thoughts on it, if you are, and its idea of of muertos? 
I am not familiar. I'm sorry. Let's look it up, shall we? Let's learn right. together. Okay. I've heard this thing before. What is what is Santeria? Uh, it's a pantheistic Afro-Cuban folk religion developed from the beliefs and customs of the Yoruba people and incorporating some elements of the Catholic religion. Okay. And who is God here? Oludomer is God. Okay, cool. Now we know what it is. Excellent. Let's go to Lucien again. I was raised with Santeria. Any opinions on their beliefs? Do we create our own death scenarios in the last moments of our brain's consciousness? Um, I think the brain has much to do with it. Um, I think, I think everything is determined by your soul. So the way you're going to die is probably predetermined. And when you're going to die is probably also predetermined. So I don't think so. I would say no to that. Do you believe then in life contracts that you sign before you come down here? I believe in, yeah, big contract that you sign before you come down here about certain things that you're supposed to do uh, because you have a soul and you have a purpose. And so you came here to uh, complete those purposes so that you could develop your soul. Yes. Okay. What about reincarnation? I believe in reincarnation also. What about it? <laughs> Just wondering, uh, why do you believe it, it, it happens? I think it takes more than one life to develop a soul. So I have to be a guy. You have to be a girl. You know, we have to have different situations where we learn because earth is like an experimental school. You're down here, trial by fire. You come down here to be miserable. That's some of the things I tell my clients. You're supposed to be miserable. This is your trial by fire. Now, how are we going to get you through this? And we have all these problems, and they really do develop you. Okay. So do, do you believe there is a a time turnaround? Like, is it is it six months is it a year human time before oh, right. the, the years before the the body's uh, or reincarnation rehappens i know i do not believe there's a time turnaround um i think it would be whatever your contract is when you go back up the, one of the things that they say in the first three days of death that um you have a life review where you see a movie of everything that's happened from birth till this life since till you die and um it, only you see it from the perspective of the other people you have affected so um then i understand there's probably guides with you saying well what do you think because nobody judges it but you because you're going to feel pretty guilty about some of it um what do you think do you think you've finished your contract down there and you know that you know um Brian Weiss believes there's a whole committee of guides that help you with that when you go back up. How do you know when you're done your contract? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I'm assuming when you go up there, somebody remembers what it was. <laughs> because before you came down here, you forget. <laughs> right. So we, all, we all have a guardian angel. I believe that. And supposedly, we all have a spiritual guide that's given to us for life. I, I understand that. Have you ever met your guardian angels? No, I haven't. I haven't done any of that kind of work. But I believe I have them. They're kind of cool. <laughs> They're kind of cool. You just need to ask. All right, let's go to the Michael Leger. Karen, do you believe that there is only fear or love? Only fear. I don't believe in only anything. I believe there's fear and there's love, but not only. There's a lot of other things in between. But fear does seem to dictate a lot of what we do in life. Yeah, I think that um, if, you, if you're thinking negatively, you're going to have a lot more fear. 
And um, of course, I see that a lot with people who have anxiety. And um, and some mothers will come in and say, well, I, you know, I worry. Really, why do you do that? Because you're just making images of what you don't want to happen. Well, it's my job to worry. So where did that come from? And so we have to figure that out. And some of these people, though, they like to worry. So yeah, a lot of therapy doesn't do much for them because they don't have a goal if they don't think about negative things and worry about them. So I believe in trying to think, what can I do in this situation? How can I make this better? Hmm. Okay. So realistically, it's a, it's a mind game within the individual person then. I think so. I think a lot of it is a positive thinking. Yes. What about people who are, everything is negative. They always seem to have that, that black cloud floating over top of them. But what about them? I mean, they're hard, they're hard to work with. <laughs> Well, define do they, that a little bit. Do they, do, they want, well, do they want to change? Because most of them do not want to change. In fact, I have a guy now who <laughs> says, his son says that he thinks very negatively. And um, I said, I agree with your son. And you've been coming here a long time. <laughs> so what are you going to do about that? And uh, he says, well, how, how do you change that? Now, this guy's been with me a long time. I'd say over 10 years. And he just comes in for coaching every once in a while. So um, I said, well, you have to learn to be positive. And he said, but the world's such a messed up world. Well, but you're, the whole point is that you find your little situation in your, you know, Monmouth County, New Jersey. How are you going to make that situation better? You have a political party you believe in? Well, fine. Work for that party. You, you want to uh, donate money to certain organizations to make the world better? Fine. But you've got to be happy in this little world in Monmouth County, New Jersey. <clears throat> Grateful for what you have. So how are we going to do that? We're going to do that with positive thoughts. So um, I'm having a new hip put in on Monday. So I'm going to be gone for three weeks at least. So he's working on positive affirmations for these three weeks. And he's going to write down, I make him write down, just like if you were coming to me to lose 50 pounds, you would do a, you know, a diary every day of, you know, what happened? When did you eat? What did you eat? And all that. He's going to write a diary like that of positive affirmations. And um, I can't believe that he, he spent sitting across from me all this time. Well, how do you do that? Well, that's what you're supposed to be doing in here. And we have worked on a lot of problems, but apparently we have not um, handled this um, negative thinking. My goodness. My goodness. Oh, okay. While we're waiting for more questions from, from our audience, the power of love is something that could manifest almost anything, I believe. Yes. You, I know, do you know, but with that being said, you know, we we tend to forget at times what is love? What is it all about? How how can it heal you? How can it free your mind, free your soul? How does that work? <sighs> um, love. Um, well, a lot of people that I see say they love each other, right? And they come in and they're fighting. and but But I love her more than anything or him. Well, really, but you don't act loving. So what would that mean to act loving? And many times people are just addicted to each other. So what does that mean? It means they're afraid of being alone. So they, they will stay in this relationship and just keep fighting about different differences, but no one has ever taught them how to problem solve the differences. And love is really learning how to negotiate differences, I think especially with the relationships that I see. And so you have to give a little and see what happens. Let them give a little and let's work with that. And then we can create something new in the relationship. But you have to give a little and she has to give a little. And when I see a couple come in, I, I hear them, both of them. And then I, I see this kind of pile in the middle of the room and that's the relationship and i kind of see what they put on there that's negative and what they put on there that's positive 
but love is caring. And I, I used to run groups and I ran this uh, relationship group for 12 weeks with these different couples that were having problems. And the first thing I said was, I want you to be nice to each other. So you just use manners that you would use at work. And you ask, uh, is this a good time? I'd like to talk to you. You are pleasant. You say thank you and please. And they, they said, really? <laughs> and just those simple things really helps your relationship just by being kind. But you've got to put love in there every day. It's really caring about the other person just as much as you care about yourself. No, and, and I absolutely see that. And, you know, do you have to love yourself, though, before oh, you can love yes. someone else? It, yes. If you're coming, you need to be coming from a place where you can you can give that and know that because what's going to happen when both of them need something? One of them has to be able to give at that time and let the other receive. So, yes, loving yourself is what we learn first, I think, in therapy and trusting yourself. Trust is a big thing. What about the power of prayer? Well, I believe in the power of prayer. And a lot of people, um, now that they're spiritual, they don't pray so much. They, they kind of talk to God which is fine. Um, but no, prayer really works. And Harvard has proved prayer works. That was like 15 years ago. Well, if Harvard says so, it must work. That's my joke. But no, prayer does work. Absolutely. And I think it's wonderful. And one of the things about prayer, too, is that we're supposed to use um, gratitude in prayer and, and, and not just, you know, uh, get on our knees and say, you know, I need a new car this week or whatever. Uh, we have to be grateful and talk about that and then pray for all the people we love and other people that we don't love. You know, we're supposed to be praying for our neighbor that we're not getting along with, which I think is difficult for a lot of people. I can see where that would be, where that would be difficult. I mean, the idea that, you know, there are people out there who do not love themselves you know, or put too much blame on their shoulders. I mean, the amount of stress and anxiety that must cause is unfathomable, unfathomable at times. Yeah. Yeah. I have to teach people sometimes that they, they have a willingness to suffer, you know, and, and in addiction, we call it codependency where, you know, um, one person just gives and gives and gives with the expectation that eventually people are going to turn around and give to them. But that never happens if you just keep giving and giving and giving and don't expect anything in return. So that's a big one where you have to teach them that they have rights. And I actually have a bill of rights that was written by Charles Whitfield. Okay, how many of these do you really believe you have? Because, it, because in order to stand up for yourself, you really have to believe you have the right to stand up for yourself. Question coming from our new listener, Lucienne. Are you aware of the Temple of Psychic Youth? I am a devoted member, and they are definitely forward-thinking, future-oriented. I'm not, but that sounds wonderful. Do you find that more young people under the age of 30, more so under the age of 20, are becoming a lot more spiritually and psychically advanced? I, I have, yes, at least the people that come into my practice. Um, and they uh, the young people believe more in reincarnation than the older people do, too. I don't know why that is. Um, but, yes, they're much easier to work with. Why do you think young people are so much more open-minded? Well, <laughs> they haven't had a lot of the um, bumps and grinds that some people have had. But... They're, they're more idealistic. They're innocent. And that's wonderful. We all want to keep a little bit of that innocence. <clears throat> um, and some people don't, um, especially the ones that think negatively and are victims, you know, um, or, or like drama in their life. And those people really, it's hard for them to, they just keep repeating this and this and this and this that proves poor me, poor me, poor me. Right. So, they don't, they don't look at what they're grateful for. And um, it's just codependency is a willingness to suffer. And you were taught that uh, by your parents when you were very young. And, you know, it takes, 
it takes many, many months of working on that to, for people to stand up for themselves and to learn to be assertive. Therapy, is, therapy is, it isn't for people that want a quick fix therapy. <clears throat> We have about four minutes to go here before we have to say good night to you. And the, the idea that younger people, like I look at my, at my daughters or I look at my son and they just seem so much more comfortable with the spirituality aspect and where their minds have, have gone. They're all believers in God. They are all, you know, very much, you know, we, we keep an open conversation about it. However, nice. however, we, I think a lot more young people are really starting to realize that mainstream religion seems to be falling by the wayside because people want to go out and they, and they're realizing that mainstream religion doesn't matter what faith or, or whatever it is, seems to be more man-made than godly made. Yes. And, and yes, and a lot of that is true because men did make the rules, you know, but a lot of them um, just believe in the golden rule. Just do unto them the way you would want to be treated. And that's beautiful. So with, with the fact that more younger people are, are finding their own spirituality, there's the age old argument. Will they still find their way to God? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't have a, um, a crystal ball, but I, I was going to tell you a story about these people in Washington, D.C. This was like 20 years ago. There was a group of people that decided they were going to meditate and they were going to teach these people all over Washington, whoever wanted to learn how to meditate and to ask for a better world in Washington, D.C. And I think they did it for something like 60 or 90 days and the crime rate, rate went down. And they, they just had a better city. But it was just an experiment they did for 90 days. Now, wouldn't it be great if we could do that everywhere? And we really could change the world. It's a beautiful thought, isn't it? It is. I love it. And maybe those young people, I mean, they evolved. They evolved from watching us. You know, and they kids aren't stupid. They can see what we're doing that isn't working. And maybe they're just evolving, which is wonderful. We have less than 90 seconds to go here before we have to say good night to you and, and let you get to bed while we kick off hour three of this show. But I wanted to say a big thank you, Reverend Karen Herrick, for coming on Spaced Out Radio. It has been an absolute blast to have you here and to learn from you regarding near-death experiences and everything in between. Do us a favor. Tell everybody about your book, where they could grab it, and where they can find more information on you. Okay. Well, they can go to KarenEHerrick.com. That's my website. And um, my first book is You're Not Finished Yet. It's about living in an alcoholic or dysfunctional home. The second book is a children's book, Grandma, What is a Soul? And the third book is The Psychology of the Soul and the Paranormal. And they all can be um, uh, received at... Um, Amazon and the last book, Psychology of the Soul, is on Kindle also. But if you go to Karen, Karen e. Herrick com, you can see a lot of free podcasts and stuff that, that are on there also. And then just uh, read about me. Any more books coming down the future? I'm thinking about one with, yeah, the Vegas Nerve um, and Mediumship. Sounds like a lot of fun. Yes. Sounds like a lot of fun. Well, we're going to say good night to you because it has been a wonderful, wonderful show with you. And thank you so much for delivering your message to our audience, Reverend Karen E. Herrick. We very much appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. I've enjoyed it. Not a problem. Coming up next on Spaced Out Radio as we head into the final hour, we're going to head to the swamp. Swamp Dwellers got another spooky story for us. Then right after that, little Timmy Senor is going to join us for the UFO report. Yeah, jam-packed, hour number three, coming up next on Spaced Out Radio. Stay tuned.
All right, we are clear. We are ever clear. Be right back. You guys just sit tight. Don't move. Don't move. Serious. Don't move. Don't move. Right. Hi, y'all. How you doing? I'm back. 
Love v. Love is back. Look at that. Look at that. Hmm. Didn't make the playoffs. But the Edmonton Oilers did. It's all that matters. All that matters. Jean Sabé Malin. I am doing great. Thank you. Besides my jaw hurting me. It is a very sad drink, the Michael LeJay. But the cream soda that was a slushy that was in it was great. I don't have an echo on my end. Is anybody else experiencing an echo? A uh, big thank you tonight to uh, Thomas. I noticed there was two super chats. Uh, very much appreciate that. Sweet Donnie Cho, Von Patrick, Louis times two, uh, Greg, Mark, and W. David Page. Thank you so much for the love. And... Here we go with hour three, everybody. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Here we go with the third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. Good to have you with us. My name is Dave Scott. Very much appreciate it. Earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on Odyssey Radio, Talk Stream Live, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Join us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do old Davy the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Oast. Oast is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as the clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot. Read the news wire. Check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. And on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. It is time once again for us to head to the swamp. Our resident swamp dweller takes us on another spooky journey. Hi, Spaced Out Radio listeners. This is Swamp Dweller. It's time for your nightly dose of spookiness on the show. If you have an interesting encounter or a spooky story that you would like to share, be sure to submit them in at swampdweller.net. You can also find our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash swampdwellerreads. Now, let's chill out, relax, and together, let's enter the swamp. I was in my last year before retiring from the Army and was going through a pretty bad divorce. My soon-to-be ex returned to Texas with my two girls, and I planned to move closer to them once my retirement was official. I rented a small, two-bedroom apartment in Tennessee in a small town called Indian Mound. Indian Mound was wet. One night, I came home around 1 in the morning from a concert in Nashville. It was early spring, and it was somewhat foggy out. The driveway dipped down and the house was about an eighth mile from the road. As I pulled in, I saw a huge black dog standing in the front yard, and it looked like a black lab or a lab mixed breed. It stood with its head up and its tail straight up. It was fixated on me. I slowly pulled my car up, unsure of what to do next. When it turned and ran into the swamp, I didn't think much of it and went inside. Over the following few months... Things started happening at night. I would always wake up around 3 or so in the morning, thinking I heard voices outside my window. And sometimes it sounded like someone or a couple of people were whispering to each other, but I couldn't quite understand what they were saying. Sometimes, I would hear footsteps of movement outside. I thought it was maybe a deer or some sort of dog, or perhaps even the dog I saw earlier. But when I looked out, I saw absolutely nothing. This type of stuff continued for months. One night, I woke up to a noise and saw it was 2.57. 
A bright white light shone through the porch glass doors. I ran out into the kitchen and looked through the small sink window and it looked like someone was out in the swamp shining a spotlight. It was one of those high-powered lights used in search and rescue. It was blinding and lit up the entire kitchen. I opened the back doors and ran onto the porch. I was yelling that I was calling the cops and to get out of here. The light suddenly went out and I heard someone moving away from the house through the swamp. The cops eventually came out, took a report, and told me to keep my doors locked and to call if anyone else came around or if anything else happened. I was hypervigilant from that day on, and sometimes I still am. I checked behind me when I was coming and going, and always slept with the shades drawn and doors locked. The footsteps around the house continued, and some nights I thought I could hear a dog panting outside my window, although I never found tracks or any signs of an animal in the morning. Things eventually did die down after a while, and I was about three months away from the end of my lease. I woke up around three in the morning, scared out of my mind, not really knowing why, honestly. I was sleeping fairly well and heard a woman calling my name in my dream out of nowhere. I opened my eyes and realized it was just a nightmare when I heard the voice call my name again, clear as day. I shot up out of my bed and turned on the lights. I checked in the closet and under the bed in every which way, every nook and cranny of the house. I opened the bedroom door and listened out in the hallway. I couldn't hear anything and was about to cut the light and return to bed when someone started pounding on my front door. I nearly jumped out of my skin. It was like someone was bashing the door with a sledgehammer. I yelled out that I had a gun and to get the hell off my property. I said I would call the cops and I'll blow your freaking head off before they get here. The pounding stopped. Cops came out again and took another report, but there was no visible damage to the door or footprints around the property. It all just stopped after that. I did actually buy a 9mm, but the rest of my time renting there was actually very peaceful. I'm back in Texas now, in an apartment complex in the suburbs, but I really don't mind. The backwoods of Tennessee were a creepy place. Also creepy is Swamp Dweller's YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Swamp Dweller Reads. We thank the Swampy for allowing us to kick off hour number three each and every night on this show with a spooky, spooky story. Yeah, he's got thousands of them on his channel for free. All you got to do is hit subscribe. Go to youtube.com forward slash Swamp Dweller Reads. From the swamp to the stars, it is time for us to take a look at little Timmy Senor and the UFO report. Nobody's going to know. They're going to know. resident tim bid how you doing there tim you know what i'm actually doing really well tonight how about yourself you know what uh, I, i'm i've been feeling really really good this week you know why do you know why i have a feeling it has to do with aliens it might have to do with aliens <laughs> our resident random guy who has been harassing us for the last few months about ET contact, well, he finally got some aliens himself. That's right. He's got aliens. You know how good that makes me feel? Redemption. I yeah. now know, you know, as a Canadian and as a kid who played hockey, I always wanted to know what it was like to raise the Stanley Cup. This is what it must feel like. That's all I'm saying. This is what it must feel like. It feels damn good, man. Yeah. Feels this is really good. Definitely a win for the Wu team. You know, having RG on our side helps at least for him to have an understanding about what we're talking about and maybe some of the urgency and some of the realities that people experience. He may try to put it in a box and whatever and call it a dream. Um, and that's, fine at some point he may uh consider some other i i know behind closed doors he's already considered the other aspect but you know it was great to watch him come around so quickly you brought that to him i don't know that was more of your day 
Dave Wu magic. I don't know. Just keep it aimed at other people. I, I'm good. I, I'm good. Oh, you're don't, next. Don't send. Don't. No, I'm good. I don't need that kind of thing. I would really. I I couldn't. You wouldn't see me on your show if that happens. You won't see me on your show anymore. I'll just be like putting myself in a little padded cell wow. somewhere. <laughs> are, are you afraid of aliens? Um. Well, I mean that's a big question. Um, I don't like to put it into that kind of terms. I'm not a fan. I'm not looking for that kind of experience. Like, I don't want to meet an ET or anything like that. I'm more interested in the nuts and bolts aspect and being able to kind of find some evidence of that and being able to prove that reality. I'm, I'm good on the woo. I, I, I'm sure, you know, it exists. Um, it's just nothing I'd ever be able to prove, right? So I'm looking well, to be able to prove it. I, I don't need to meet E.T., Dave. Thank you. I'm good. We're going to, you know what? We're going to uh, put our thoughts and prayers towards <laughs> you here. Yeah. I don't need but, it. I, I'm, I'm good. No, 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 no. Don't, don't be that way. <laughs> you know, we're okay. just going to thumb this in very gently. You're going to just relax. And no, I'm good, man. It's, it's cool. Oh, it's all good. It's all good. You know, you get you'll get something, don't worry. I'll wear my Apple Watch in defense. I hear they don't take you if you've got your Apple Watch on. Oh, they take you. It's just <laughs> the Apple Watch now records it. I know, I know. I'm just joking. I want to get into a couple of big stories that happened this week, courtesy of a very good friend of this show, Matt Ford, and his YouTube channel, which is the Good Trouble Podcast. All right, Matt is a or the Good Trouble Show. Pardon me. There it is. Matt Ford. Okay, and Matt is what he is is he's a guy who, you know, who started his show very politically. Okay, but he seems to over the last few weeks and months really gotten into the UFO story. And we interviewed Matt a couple of months ago, and he basically, he basically said that. He is, you know, very fascinated. And, you know, if, if you look at the politics of Matt, he is from California. He's he's quite democratic. And he has stated that, you know, on his show, a lot more Democrats don't seem to either get or care for the UFO story. That's what he told us on his on the on our show here. So he has because he has uh, gathered a, a very strong interest in this topic He's trying to educate his audience regarding the UFO story. And I think it's brilliant. You know, politics aside, doesn't matter. I don't care what side of the ledger you sit on. The fact is, education of this topic is very good. And this week, he's had a couple of power shows coming up. And one of the ones I want to start with is with Gary Nolan. Dr. Gary Nolan of Stanford University was interviewed by Matt earlier this week. And one of the topics that hit, and it's really, really short, okay, but one of the topics that hit from that was the fact that both Gary Nolan and others who were involved in this story of extraterrestrials seem to believe that within the next six months, the next six months, there could be there could be some serious, serious knowledge coming out about non-human intelligence, NHI, aliens, like random guys, aliens. What's your thoughts on this, Tim? Um, on the preparation. Um, I think that it's very interesting. Um, I'm definitely willing to bet that that is coming soon. Um, I've also hear, heard, you know, Ross Colhart recently spoke, and uh, he believes that there's going to be another hearing uh, before one of the House committees, probably the Oversight Committee or maybe the House Services Committee, come the 13th of June. So coming up pretty soon. And in that 
um, that would be something that was behind closed doors. And that would be where some of the whistleblowers were able to discuss some of these harder to talk about topics um, and perhaps share data that normally wouldn't be able to sh be shared publicly. Um, and so we're starting to hear some of the topics that could potentially be brought forward. Um, we know also that potentially Eric Davis was approached at least to be a whistleblower. Um, I don't think much of a response came. I think maybe he just asked for them to talk to his lawyer to get his position on that. But um, I'm, don't quote me on that. That might be a rumor. I don't know where I heard it, but I think that's kind of the position there. But it is interesting to see that also um, things like Havana syndrome could be brought to light um, and some cases, medical cases related to UAP and specifics could be brought to light. So yeah, I see quite a lot coming forward. And the fact that they're bringing the term NHI um, into our new parlance is absolutely fine. I think that non-human is a great description. Uh, so why not? you know, make that the new term for an entity, right? Isn't that more more what it is? The NHI is non-human intelligence, inferring some kind of being or intelligence, right? So I think these are massive strides. And I do see it coming quickly. Okay, so the idea that this is going to actually be some sort of true disclosure by far there's a lot of hurdles that seem to have to go into this. Okay. I mean, Gary Nolan is a smart guy. He has his own laboratory named after him at Stanford university. You don't get a job with an elite school like Stanford, you know, being uh, a dummy on subjects, you know, and also, Dr. Dolan has come out publicly as an experiencer of the phenomena as well. And over the years, he has been testing the brains of said experiencers to see what type of effects UFOs or alien contact have had on people. And I don't know if it's going to actually happen, but these are some incredibly bold words right now, Tim that we are hearing that in six months, we could be learning that aliens are actually visiting this planet or are here right now. We may not find out where they're coming from, but this just opens up a whole new ball game for humanity. And it's a topic that we have said on this show a number of times where I don't think that this world is ready for any type of extraterrestrial contact. And we've gone over everything about that. How do you feel about this? Oh, I definitely feel like we're ready for whatever truth it is, whatever the truth is on the extraterrestrial visiting the earth, whatever that is, we should definitely get the truth. Um, and the fact that they're hiding it or potentially hiding whatever truth there is, is incredibly frustrating. Um, now, do I believe that that's what's happening? I kind of don't. I don't think they really know. Um, and so they may be searching out from people in the know whether it's really happening, whether it's demonstrable and, and provable and all these sorts of things. But, um, you know, consider the fact that just, um, I'm not sure when, but recently Major John... General John Olson, the Chief of Space Operations Mobilization Assistant to U.S. Space Force, came out and made a statement rec recently about UFOs and whether they're visiting the planet. And I thought that his statement and his position that he made publicly was massive. <clears throat> and if you're okay with it, I can kind of give you the quote. Yeah, absolutely. And so um, <clears throat> the moderator asks the final question, uh, Major General Olson, what do you think about the unidentified aerial phenomenon, UAP or and UFOs? And uh, Major General Olson replies, 
Well, this is a very hot topic, and I appreciate the question. I know, admittedly, on UFO, uh, or I'm sorry, the Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Task Force is quite a mouthful in an acronym. And he says, I've gotten that question a couple other times. So skimming down and briefly getting to the point here, uh, he says, quite frankly, having flown 83 different airplanes and had lots of hours, we've all seen lots of unexplainable elements. And the cosmos, the space realm, is so large. If we look at the Earth, it is a tiny blue dot in an unlimited, almost incomprehensibly large cosmos. I personally believe that there absolutely, from a probability perspective, is life out there. And so he goes on to talk about how, um, you know, bringing the task force and the government's approach to systematically investigating and understanding these phenomenon, uh, because, of course, unidentified elements present a national security concern and present a safety of flight, present a risk that we must take and diligently pursue. <clears throat> so he does go on to put that it's actually more broadly put. And that is, we will continue this effort. And in fact, I believe that we will be getting more funding and more of a structural support level within the department. And so he is obviously getting into some details here about the interagency task force and um, some of the efforts that are being made there. But um, he's also talks further about uh, the solar system and our probes to the moon and that we have gone in peace to explore and discover. And he says that we continue that yearning to see and discover, is there life out there? And what does that meaning mean for humanity? And the uh, moderator goes on to further probe, but I found that um, an absolutely perfect answer. Um, and so if that is the true feeling of somebody in that position, I, I feel pretty good about having him as a, as a decision maker. What are your thoughts, Dave, hearing that? Well, it all, it all does come down to budget. And that also ties in to our second topic of the night, which we will get to after the break, which is Matt Ford breaking the news that April 19th, there is going to be, looks like new hearings in Washington, DC regarding the arrow program. And, the study of UFOs and what's going on. And we will get into that momentarily, but you know what? I, I don't believe you when you say that we are ready. I believe the UFO community is ready for the most part, the mainstream public that is more worried about soy lattes and wokeness and, and anti wokeness and, and fighting wars and, and everything like that, their bank accounts, whatever. I don't think they're ready. I look at people all around me. There's a lot of people who are, you know, they may believe that there are aliens out there, but that's way out there, Tim. That's way out there. Coming here, different story. And I think it could cause a whole rash of problems that we are not ready for. I really don't believe that. <clears throat> we may have to agree to disagree on this simply because um, I see people's deep interest in it. I see a lot of open-minded people, even some older generation people are warming up to it when their favorite newspaper has it in their headlines. And the fact is that now we're starting to talk about exoplanets and NASA is really pushing for our move back to the moon reinvigorating people's interest in this in space and getting out of our heliosphere so to be completely honest with you i think that they would be ready for that now i feel that we've also been slightly prepared with the fact that we've been insinuating that we may be able to find evidence of interstellar life right here by looking at meteor meteoric rocks well i'm going to end this as we go to break here with this say about 11 minutes ago, you stated you never wanted to meet an alien. You don't want to meet an alien. But at the same time, you're saying you, you think we're ready for aliens. We'll continue that debate. Tim Cedar, the UFO Report, when we return on Spaced Out Radio.
All right, we're clear. Fun show. It's a nice shirt you got on today. It's new. <laughs> there you go. It's actually a bunch of old shirts sewn together to make a new shirt. Mm -hmm. It's a recycled shirt. I'm such a green person. Recycling. Look at that. It's not for everyone, I'm sure, but it sure is comfortable. That's awesome. That is awesome. Tony's right. Oh, yeah. Ready or not, we're all going to get aliens. I just... I, I'm going to bite my tongue here for a second because I, I hate talking topic during the break. Right. Because it... Yeah, I get it. Uh -huh. Hey, it's don't blame me, random gee. Don't take, blame me. Take notes. No more blaming me. I'm out. I just love the specifics, the F and the U, Dave. Oh, yeah. That is probably my favorite part of the story. Mm hmm He confused his aliens. McFab, laser, and powder. I know I met Tim in Oregon at some point. Who's saying this? Someone McFab, might have. McFab, laser, and powder in the chat room. Welcome to our chat room. Hmm. By the way, it is that time of the night, Tim, where we say hello to all the agents and alphabet agencies tuning us on in for Spaced Out Radio tonight. Give us a call sometime. We don't need to give you our numbers because you already have them. Please remember, both Tim and I can be bought. We can be bought. Yep, we can be bought. Evan Walters, you're pissing me off, too. Big time. Keep it up, Evan. Exactly. Poking the bear. Yeehaw. <laughs> it is fun. He's so pokeable. He's like the Pillsbury Dough Bear. Yep. Joey Zed, what's happening? Stu Gerson, how are you? To all my friends with a hook for a hand, how are you? That's funny. That was a pirate joke. That that is that's a funny pirate joke. Sorry. I, just, I went with it. I didn't know you could be funny. I make it up as I go, my friend. That's why it's hit or miss. It's hit or miss. Love it. I think I, most of my humor is for like 10 and under. <laughs> it's like to get my kids to laugh, you know. The old ones have learned I'm not funny at all. I get the eye rolls. A lot. You tell a lot of dad jokes, don't you? <laughs> I mean, I, I'm a dad and I do tell jokes. So <laughs> you do the math. <laughs> yeah, probably. I mean, I don't have a book or anything that I refer to. <laughs> yeah, they're bad. Mm -hmm. I actually, Terry Hall knows there's a place called Infinity in downtown Salem, the Infinity Club. It's stand up. And I have done a couple of 10 minute bits. And it's all about baldness, showering, and uh, my wife and kids, you know? And so I never tell anyone that I'm going to go. I just show up. But Terry Hall. Is like I'm just gonna be in the audience one day, and I'm like, oh, it's gonna really throw me off. And that is not dad jokes. Those none of those are dad jokes. I've gotten some approval. Some are not family approved. So, yeah. 
We got uh, 30 seconds. Thank you to W. David Page, Louis Times 2, Mark, Greg, and Vaughn, along with Sweet Donnie Cho and Thomas Times 2 for the amazing super chats. Very much appreciate the love and support. Don't forget, you can go get your SOR swag at spacedoutradio.com. And you have until tomorrow night to get your VIP tickets for the SOR fan party where little Timmy Senor is going to be there. Here we go, everyone. We rounded third. We're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. My name is Dave Scott. Very much appreciate earning your listening ears. Reminder to all of you that if you miss most of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do old Davey the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot. Read the newswire. Check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. Here we go. We continue on with Little Timmy Senor and the UFO Report. The big question that we are debating, discussing, is humanity ready for extraterrestrial contact? Tim seems to believe so. I think he is being naive. Tim, welcome back. Thanks for having me. You don't seem happy about this debate. Are you not happy? Tonight? Well, I see that I've created a conundrum for myself because I am very much for the truth. And if they're here, I want to know. But do I want to have kind of a the uh, quote unquote abduction experience? No, I don't. Now, if my neighbor was an alien this whole time and I just didn't know. Great. <laughs> great. I'm cool with meeting an alien. Um, but. Typically, I think that it's not there. I don't think it's like that. More than likely, it's like what happened to random gay here. And, uh, you know, I mean, I'm open to it. And I mean, I'm very clear about the, the portion of this that I'm interested in is the nuts and bolts and being able to prove it and coming back with data and things like that. Now, that's the, not the same conversation as meeting an entity or a being of some sort. Those are two totally, totally different things. Um, well, let me let me ask you this. Yeah. Okay, because I think this is going to be an interesting <laughs> part of the conversation. Okay. Why do you believe that 8 billion people on this earth, some of which are still partying like it's 1499, <laughs> okay, why do you believe that humanity is ready for the second largest story in the history, the first being Jesus Christ himself coming back from the heavens, second being alien contact. Why do you believe that humanity is ready? Oh, that's it's, I mean, based on that, I would have to go just on the fact that it's, it's now or never. I mean, there's no, there's no point. I think that we could draw historically where we'd be like, Oh, we were ready then. Like in at what point do you think that our society as a whole or our planet as a whole is going to be ready? This, when you try to introduce anything new, it gets really um, scrutinized by the planet, whether it's a religious concept or any scientific concept or anything. Remember what happened with, you know, <laughs> Galileo, right? Just to use that as an example. Um, but the point is, is that you have to just draw a line at some point. And it's, it is kind of a now or never, because we are at a turning point where if the government continues to lie about whatever the truth is, people are going to lose faith in the government. And at this point, it's so publicly being asked of them that they're kind of having to come up with something and it, they're very quickly being cornered into the truth, whatever that is. And so I think one way or another, you know, maybe 
only half of us really are as a, as a world ready for the fact that there's aliens here already. Um, the other half will come around, right? As, as everything does, life continues on. And especially if you give within that knowledge that they've been here for a long time and there's no ill intent, I think that that message would come over a lot clearer and better. And the fact is that, you know, it's un, it's hard to find because of where it resides, potentially at the bottom of the ocean or up beyond, beyond 60,000 feet or in a light dimension that we can't see with our naked eye, whatever that is. Um, obviously, it's been here for a while. If it wanted to mess with us, it could. I'm not saying it hasn't, right? But to whatever extent. Um, yeah, I think, you know, we could have done it with Eisenhower and perhaps it was attempted, you know, and, you know, I, anyone can make these arguments. But I don't feel like as a whole, the society is ever going to be 100% ready. And it never has been. It probably never will be. But you have to draw a line at some point and just be like, we're as ready as we'll ever be. And I feel like that is now. And I, simply because our media has primed us, we've had 20 years of really good film that has prepared us for this topic. However they come to us, um, it's going to be something that we will come around to. Okay. I think you made some good points. I, I really do. Now, if you don't mind me countering. Please. Okay. 20 years of movies have seen everything about us shooting at extraterrestrials and defeating them to protect our planet, which has really helped post a, a portrait that aliens coming down are evil. We have people like Tom DeLonge coming down and saying all aliens are bad, where in the meantime, right before he went public with his uh, to the Stars Academy, he tried to buy the free experiencers statistics that show that 84% of all people who've had ET interaction have had positive experiences and would like those interactions to continue up to 90%. So we have a lot of wrong and falsehoods about this. DeLong going on on Joe Rogan and saying, we got to put nuclear weapons up in space so that way we can shoot the aliens down because they are afraid of our nuclear weapons. Are you kidding me? If you can travel through wormholes to get here from whatever solar system you're in or universe you're in, do you really think they're going to be worried about our primitive nukes? I don't think so. Here's the other part, religion. Whether, you know, North America over the last 30 years especially has become extremely agnostic and or atheist. However, we get off of this part of the rock, we go to the rest of the world, there is still the majority of this planet that believes in religion one way or another. And almost every religion has in common one thing, that anything that comes from the sky is evil and darkness awaits. How are they going to react to all of a sudden saying aliens are here? How are the stock markets going to react when all of a sudden people are panicking? Remember, Lou Elizondo stated on this show that during COVID, the government and the and the agencies involved and the people involved with this subject were actually paying attention to how people would react during a mass pandemic and or mass world problem, which COVID was. And what did we do? We stole toilet paper for no reason, even though there was never a shortage. There was never a shortage of meat. Yet people were going to the store buying, you know, one, two, three thousand dollars worth of meat. People were jumping or buying out hand sanitizer and then selling those little mini hand bottles for up to $75 to $100 a piece on Amazon before they got shut down. Milk, people were buying 10, 12 gallons of milk at a time when they knew they would never drink it all and majority would go bad. People were hoarding medicine where people who had real problems 
could not get their medication to help them stay healthy. That was a big, big red flag. What's going to happen with aliens? Okay. Now, where I agree with you, where I see the alien disclosure coming out is this. I think what happens is in six months' time, they do not admit that aliens are here if that actually happens. But I think what's going to happen is they're going to say, we have picked up a signal from a far-off galaxy that shows the potential of extraterrestrial life. We have found a, a potential life form somewhere else. It's the most politically correct way to do it without having to get into the UFO and alien game here. Your thoughts? Oh, yeah. I definitely think they'll admit to life off planet before they admit to alien life here. I see that absolutely. And they're going to do it on Mars. You know, so that is going to be one way to ease the public into it. But you're absolutely right. It's not going to be easy for everyone. And you'll have deniers across the board. But you did bring up Tom DeLong, and uh, Tiny Klaus had a recent tweet from him and a quote. Um, if you're cool with it, I'll read it. Yeah, please do. So Tom DeLong on the UFO phenomenon saying it has a hive mind, right? So in the quote, it says, the UFO phenomenon has a hive mind. These creatures, they potentially don't have souls. They are like clones, and they worship their own technology to some degree. They feed off fear and negativity. The one thing they cannot stand is the frequency of elevated human consciousness. So what's the best way to keep us from elevating our consciousness? You crash a craft, the transistor pops up, then you get video games and iPhones and all these things. You walk, you walk around like a cyborg, a soulless little hive mind, all getting direction from devices. From Tom DeLong, Pretty dark. I think he's been watching The Matrix. Well, don't forget that Tom DeLong only listens to one ufologist, and that is Peter Lavenda, who comes at this from a very, very negative standpoint. Okay, I'm not saying that Peter Lavenda is not a great researcher. He's been in the field a long time, and, you know, this is what his studies show. Tom DeLong has lapped it up like a puppy dog. Yeah. And it comes back it comes back to the point Tim of this. Tom DeLong has never answered the question. And I have asked him this on Twitter cuz he's never accepted an interview request from us. But I've asked him on Twitter and he a couple of times and he is and he is denied the question. If the extraterrestrials are that evil, why did he try to buy up the free experiencer statistics, which prove otherwise? Now, I'm not saying, Tim, that every extraterrestrial species is good, has our best interest in mind, okay? Has the power to bring humanity up to another level where we're not dying from cancer where we're not having children blind or missing limbs or we are given a a three four five six hundred year lifespan okay that's what i would like i could go another three four hundred years for sure <laughs> okay but the point that i'm Best getting things. at it but the point that i'm getting at is this not every human being is good all right we have serial killers we have people who who torture children, enslave people. Look at a certain island that a, a certain dead guy used to own that that would bring young ladies there and very famous people. Not this Jurassic crap, Park. Definitely not Jurassic Park. Okay. Okay. But you get into there's a lot of bad people out there, man. Okay, this world is not made of good people. Yeah. Okay, look at the regime in North Korea. Yeah, no, I agree. But I think to bring in this dystopia 
society concept just because of aliens, but to address the fact so dystopia, meaning that kind of post-apocalyptic, very drastic, very, you know, subhuman existence insinuated by the addition of aliens to humanity. I think that that proposes a very dark outlook and it, we have no evidence that that is potentially what would happen, you know? Um, and so it's just, it's hard to listen to, but to be honest, um, when it comes to a dystopia society, I would address that connection more to AI possibilities than the alien connection. Cause it doesn't seem like aliens have ill intent to humans. However, um, we've designed AI to be better than us. You know, that's the reason we have it. So if it's addressing the fact that it's going to be out doing humans at some point, it's going to realize it doesn't need us anymore. And so the fact that we're trying to put this boundary on it, I think is laughable, but that's a whole nother topic, but just the dystopia concept for alien intermingling with humanity. I found that to be a very dark outlook. Um, do you agree? Or, I mean, how do you feel? I feel that, you know, we can't judge a book by, by one person's cover. All right. And look, I am somebody who has had good contact, bad contact and horrific contact. Okay. I didn't like the, the horrific one. All right. Did not like that at all. The bad contact. Well, I don't know much about that. The good contact. I'd take it every day every day and we don't know what's out there we don't know what's coming this way and that is one of the dangers that we have but to sit there and say that humanity is ready i don't think so i don't think so at all and you know i don't want to be a pessimist on it but we're many people right now that are scared of their own shadow let, al yeah. and then, let alone a little gray dude coming into their house, standing at their feet and saying, hey, dude, what's going on? Right. Dave, consider the fact that we are seeing this elevation in the media, elevation on pressure in the government to make decisions, and it's becoming very topical. And we're pretty much you can't go anywhere without somebody having something to say on it and have an opinion on it. Um, do you not see that potentially as being maybe up to and i'm not going to call it the phenomenon let's just call it whatever it is at this point it's up to whoever that is the other um entity or whatever it is that's creating this movement you know that we're seeing um wouldn't you think that this is more on their timeline and that we're just running behind it trying to play catch up so whether or not we're ready it's coming sort of thing like kicking and screaming the government obviously is going into this kicking and screaming but the public is looking for the truth meanwhile the timeline is up to none of us because it's ramping itself up we're seeing more and more evidence potentially and the meanwhile the military is covering it up as quickly as they can there are too many questions that need to be answered publicly before any sort of et contact happens why now is the biggest one why after seven years and i don't i don't give credit to the to the stars academy that they brought this topic to the government okay yes they brought many topics to the government lou elizondo and chris mellon need to be re rewarded and, and and given good handshakes for that okay i'm not trying to sound negative but there was no need for this topic to come out. It hasn't come out in 60, 70 years. There was no need to all of a sudden give the tinfoil hatters credence that they were right. Like I've said before, and I will state it again, there are only two answers to why now that I can find. Number one, it's an alien false flag. If you want to talk real tinfoil, that's what Dr. Stephen Greer believes. Or B, which I believe, contact was made 
and they, whoever they are, gave the dates of when they are coming. And if it's 35 years from now, you need to start preparing now. And the generation of religious people and older people who are afraid of their own shadow will die off. And the younger generation, which is open more spiritually, open more psychically, open more intuitively, and generally is less judgmental, they will be ready for it. Your kids will be ready for it. My kids will be ready for it. My grandson will be ready for it. Many uh, grandchildren will be ready for it. Our age and up, they don't care about us. We're the alien boomers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I think you're probably right there. Um, you really sewed that up perfectly well. Um, I, you know, I, I would like to think that whatever does happen, it rolls out in a really positive way. I don't like the fact that typically we're a shoot first, ask questions after society. That doesn't bode well for first contact. But Dave, just very quickly, I know we're getting a little limited on time, but when do you feel like first contact was made if you were to have a guess and to look at media do you think it was recent like around the time that they started to put the theologians together and ask them how they would react do you think it was around that time or do you think it was a long time ago with eisenhower i don't thoughts know. I, I, pose I, a I, guess I, pose a guess just to be educated I, I, would, I would say if eisenhower actually met extraterrestrials at holloman air force base I think that's where it began. I think that's where the abduction numbers began, which coincide with the FBI's missing people numbers. Okay. I think it began then. And I think a deal was made. And I think a timeline has been set. And on that note, little Timmy Senor, we are going to have to say goodnight on this great show tonight. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, at work, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone in our chat rooms tonight. YouTube, Twitch, LGAP, Facebook, Spreaker, the Space Travelers Club, LinkedIn, and on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Somewhere. Remember, this show is copyrighted by Space Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us. Because together, my friends, we own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night. Soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we got room for them, too. Good night. Good job, little Timmy Senor. Fun show. Hey, your hair is looking on point tonight, buddy. It just yeah. looks tight. Feeling thin tonight. Yeah, you're looking sharp. You know. Yeah. Hey, Major Lee, how you it's, doing? It's working. Where's Gee? He should be hopping in here any minute, I hope. I text that him. That is Billy Gunn. Good to see you. I'm an ass man. <laughs> great no, one of the greatest know. wwf theme songs ever t harp welcome to sor chat 
Gnome Squatch, good to see you. I'm an ass man. <laughs> random Gee. Calling out to Random Gee. <laughs> he messaging you? Um, he is not responding. He's he might be night night. Um I do Sometimes, have... Joe. No, he's not night nighting. All right. Oh, no. there he is. There he is. He's he throwing said... all sorts of squishy kisses at his at the at the love of his life right now. Oh, he says send it. It is sent. It was sent like half an hour ago. I caramba this guy. <laughs> Almost an hour ago. Remove remove phone from pocket. I do have breaking news when he gets here. Oh, do you? I do. Would it be that Random Gee has aliens? <laughs> yeah. No, I've got something sweet. It's totally sweet. We totally forgot to talk about Gillibrand. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. We did it last night. Um, while he comes in, can I just go check upstairs real quick? Yeah, you go. I know it. Yeah, not a problem. Hello, Nicole Sackich. Welcome back. I did, Gizmo, get the Bledsoe book. Mystics Walk, how you doing? Good morning, Skip to Malou. Where's Gee? Jesus Christ, Gee! Oh, here he comes. Good old Gee. There he is. I had to like totally re edit all this stuff and I lost my avatar and everything. You're an avatar. Why don't you just turn your camera on? Hold on. I'm in, Let um, your I'm honey in the... bunches of oats see your beautiful eyes. All right. Hold on a second. I'm trying to situate something. Let me set a good avatar first. Hold on. Um. I was looking for something. There we go. Sorry, I'm walking back to my bed. I didn't want to show you guys all the whips and chains. Well, we know you're that kind of guy. All right. There we go. All right, here we go. Oh, I'm getting message. Who's messaging me? Who could it possibly be? Ah, there I am. Gee. Hey, Gee. What's, there he is. What's up, fellas? Okay, before we get into the heavy stuff here, Gee, there's going to be a great WWE show on the Iron Sheik, who I think is still the greatest WWF champion of all time. Okay. With the camel clutch. Who's your favorite champion of all time? I'm going to tell you something that's going to break your heart. I've never seen a single wrestling match in my life, even when I was a child. Oh, my God. You're ripping my heart out right now. Even when Hulk Hogan and Hulk Mania was a big thing in the 80s, I was like, this is fake and stupid. But go ahead. Much like aliens, eh? Yeah, I just don't believe in stuff. like. So uh, we have a few people requesting, because they weren't here the other night, mm -hmm. requesting to to hear your very, very vulgar story. About oh. uh, you're getting aliens on Monday night. First of all, what is the stuff about Nicole number one? No, Dave. Hold on. Never mind. I'll leave that alone. I'm um, number one. I'm number one. Okay. Where's Tim in the hierarchy here? He's an <laughs> ass man. 
<laughs> hey, look who it is. Ross Dogs, Broken Spirit. So what, are we recapping my dream that I had? Well, we have a few. Well, first <laughs> off, it wasn't a dream. It was definitely a dream. Or else it would have happened again. No. No. Because you're random guy and it happens randomly. Yeah, that's hmm. not that's not the math on that. Okay. Okay, let's pretend it, Tim, just for shits and giggles tonight, let's pretend it was a dream, shall are we? we? Doing the, are we doing the NC-17 version of this story? Or are of we doing course the- we are. <laughs> you have to. That's the best part of the story. This is like, it's after midnight of my time. It's like Skinamax hour. We're good. Yeah. Okay. So am I telling the story? Skinamax it yeah, up. Hold on. What's Skinamax? It's Cinemax. <laughs> the scribbly um, stuff that you you're don't know what Cinemax watch. is. Do you have HBO in Canada? You don't know what HBO is, Dave. They don't believe don't in nudity HBO. until they don't believe in nudity until after marriage in Canada. <laughs> Como se dice movies up there. <laughs> Donde esta es la titi? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but okay. So Cinemax is like HBO. It's a massive like home movie network and they always show like mm, like mm, mm, really mm, mm, song, mm. Song, yes yeah yes. At, at night no it's like penetration all teenage no boys finishing oh. flip over to cinemax so he calls it skinemax trying to be funny oh i guess i'm not funny now okay. no popularly thanks, known thanks, as skinemax no longer funny i mean it was a little weak to be okay. honest. I'm just kidding. I mean, it's a little above a dad joke. Right? Oh, don't even get me started. I have a pocket full of dad jokes right here. Somewhere. I thought Julie had a good one earlier. It was great with the turtle. Did she have and a joke? She had a great joke earlier. I love jokes. Okay, so let me set the scene. There I was. <laughs> Buck naked. SOR um, had SOR had just gone off the air for the night. Am I doing this right, Mr. Radio Guy? <laughs> hey, I'm just paying attention to put a smile on my face. All right. So I was watching the ninth year anniversary show, as many of you were the other night, where Dave recounted his experience with a beautiful young woman. I forget her name. Samantha Mowat. Her. And they were talking about how they were in the forest as platonic friends, experiencing aliens, which was already amazing in itself. <laughs> Sorry, I'm that guy random guy it was awesome he went detail to detail what he felt what he thought what he heard in his mind what happened to the dogs it was it's an fluffy. amazing journey it's fluffy i was cap i was captivated i was captivated by this tale that dave told so much so i see where you're going with this <laughs> so much so no i was so tired i stayed up extra late i had gotten up early that morning and I was so tired, I went to sleep immediately. Now, normally I put on my Apple Watch and other things to monitor my sleep because I'm a hypochondriac like that. This evening, I did not. I was so tired in my haste, I simply passed out. I awoke, okay, and this is not a Christmas poem. I awoke to a clatter of sorts. And upon my gaze opening at three in the morning, I looked upon my foot, the foot of my bed. He's gone medieval on us. And I noticed something was astray from the norm. I noticed there was two shapes at the foot of my bed. As I gazed up, I noticed it wasn't just shapes. It was two gray aliens, and one was short, and one was taller. Not as tall as me, but taller. Knowing immediately now I'm sleeping and dreaming, I looked at the tall one, who was definitely focused on me with his almond-shaped eyes. I said, fuck you, Dave! (laughs) As soon as I said that, The big one looked at the little one and was like, who the fuck does this guy think he is? Closed my eyes, 
I'm not playing. I don't do fucking woo. Not doing bad dreams. I'm going back to sleep. Close my eyes. What seemed to be about 10 seconds later, I wake up and I'm sitting in a chair in what I could best describe as a surgical room. My face is numb like lidocaine or from a dentist doing teeth work. And there's a bunch of these things running around. And again, I'm like, well, this dream sucks because I thought that would be the end of it. So I'm sitting there. I'm like, oh, uh-uh, I can't move. I can't talk. They're doing whatever they're doing over here in my mouth. I could feel the pressure, feel the pressure, but I couldn't see what they're doing. And they pull me flat down on like the same kind of cart they use at the morgue, like that solid steel. Like we're going to biohazard this thing when you get off of it, Matt. Lay me face down. They had some kind of drill. And as soon as it touched my mouth, I thought had that thought because Dave told this story about his head getting cut open. And I'm like, this is how I know I'm dreaming again because I'm citing Dave's words. And he said, you don't feel any pain. And I remember telling myself, am I going to feel pain right now when this happens? But it's just a dream. But am I going to feel the pain? As soon as I felt the pressure of it touch my mouth, snap, woke up in bed. Only about, I don't know, half an hour had transpired since I fell asleep. Between when I saw the first dream and the second dream and my hyperventilation. Did I tell it, did I tell it with enough moxie this time for you, Dave? Well, the poll numbers suggest that 71% feel that you got aliens. I don't think so. But it makes Dave really excited, so I, I'll tell the story. That was all my... I'm saying, all I'm saying, dude, is... Uh, oh, uh, one of our listeners here, Nicole, has a question for you. Mr. One of your Red, listeners? What do you is remember the dream within the dream you woke up in? I don't remember telling that part of the story. How would this this random viewer know this information insider are you watching me nicole do you have do you have a chip on me well she probably can a deck uh can uh figure out alien implants mm -hmm. did you tell did you hear about the doorbell did she tell you about the doorbell uh, there's apparently a new story about this going on now where I will tell you my trigger. Okay. You want to know my trigger? What is it? Pink Floyd's. Is there anybody out there? Nice. I wish that mine's a fucking doorbell. <laughs> so what's happening with the doorbell? There, so since, since this has occurred, as I told you and her and others, was if it doesn't happen again, it's not real. It's just a dream. Like, I'm open to an experience, but whatever. I really don't think that's what it was, even today. But here's the weirdest damn thing. This happened, what, four days ago, I think? You yeah. guys remember better than me. I think it was four days ago. Every single morning, every, without exception, since, I've had no dreams, I've had no encounters, I've had no hallucinations, but the most weird thing has happened. Every single morning, it doesn't matter if I wake up at 7 a.m. or 11 a.m. or what's going on the night before, what I drink, what I don't drink, I hear ding dong loud as hell. So what I do is I wake up, I have a doorbell at my house, I actually have a video camera doorbell at my house, so I have two. Grab my phone, check my camera, which has both doorbells in frame. For three days in a row, I have awoken to a freaking doorbell sound two-tone doorbell loud i mean loud as shaking like as loud could be it's clearly in my head once again fuck you dave could it be coming <laughs> from your mouth my mouth no i can't make a ding dong it's like meow, meow, you know like you walk into home depot and the door moves or something like that kind of quickie mart thing but it's loud as hell I think he's just lining up jokes. 
I, I've been holding back on so many jokes just hearing you. Me. It's fine. Go. No, it's You're past. Up. I just, I didn't. I'm just letting it because you said something about every morning when you've been waking up. And I was like, oh. Every morning when I. What? You put the ball right on the tee for me. And I'm like, no, uh, I'm not going to. The it. swatter. What, what is the name of the road I live on? Are you kidding me? Why would you want to know that? All you need to know is he lives at Crystal Lake. <laughs> There's a Crystal Lake around here. Friday the 13th. Yes, that's the reference. Uh, uh oh. There's a Joe. The ding dong you're hearing is them turning on your implant. Is that a thing? Is that what's going on now? Like when I wake up, they're like recording my experiences for their upload. Is that what's going on? Little gray brother is watching. It would have been better if it was like Lincoln Park or something, but a fucking ding dong. Like, <laughs> anyways, you know, I I'm, I'm joking, but I'm not joking. That I just so you guys know, this is not made up. It actually happened. Do I believe it's aliens? No, but Dave, of course, is going to run with it. The weirdest. That's because it was aliens. <laughs> Whatever, it man. Is, Whatever makes you feel. Your psychologist, mm. Nicole, tends My to think that aliens too. Yeah, I pay her a retainer to <laughs> monitor me. Go ahead, Tim. I know you want to say it. Do it. Do it. I know. Let it fly. This is, this is way too public to be throwing this kind of material out for free. I don't I think can't. So. You know what? Kidding. We need a pay. Do you have a Patreon, Dave? We need to put some of this behind the paywall. <laughs> because we're, we got some we got some juice. We got some juicy stuff. We need to put it behind the paywall. <laughs> You just keep setting me up for these beautiful jokes, and I'm just. But you're not what? telling them. I mustn't. I must I would not. Tell I've got too much respect for the crowd. They haven't seen that side of me. <laughs> Penny, you're funny. How'd you know Avon calling? <laughs> it was Tupperware. It was Tupperware I ordered back in '91 finally showed up. <laughs> All the Tupperware sales shit. Isn't that nuts? They're begging for money now. All my Again. mom's friend, all my mom's friends in the late eighties were doing Tupperware sales. We're doing Tupperware parties now. They're doing pleasure parties. That's awkward, but I've heard a little bit, a lot about that. Huh? We're gonna buy candles. It's not candles. <laughs> not candles. Vibrating candles. It's not candles, guys. If your wife says they're buying candles, it's not candles. I it's promise. More of a, more of a lava lamp. <laughs> Um, so are you sure. guys ready for the breaking news? Yes. Okay. I, I heard there's something going on, actually. I'm getting text. Oh, Go there's ahead. something. Okay, stand No, by. like, my texts are kind of going... I'm kind of twittering right now to see what's going on. Huh. Okay, well, this is it. So, um, as of 4 p.m., this story broke. And I'm just going to read it as soon as my reader populates so um a secret documents leak reveals up to four additional chinese spy balloons flew over continental u.s intelligence reports classified as top secret have been leaked revealing that as many as four additional chinese spy balloons entered the united states airspace during january and february the balloons were equipped with sensors and antennas that the U.S. government was unable to detect or intercept. There is more information here, but do you guys want to yeah, give me a going. thumbs up, thumbs down on that? Go with it. Okay, well, that's kind of the headline. Um, do you guys want to, as I bring up more information, give me your first thoughts? Uh, that's amazing. Thoughts? Duh. <laughs> I can I mean, we we've kind of known this as a thing, right? And I I being completely non political, apolitical when I say this, because and I'm only bringing it up because I said it before. The powers that be administratively that run our country right now. For and it's not political, I promise you. Right. And seriously, so it's not being done the right way. And that's not just my opinion. It's a lot of other people's opinion. You mean there should be some more transparency 
to it? No, I mean, uh, the focus right now is on stupid shit. That's not, it's, we're safe. I really do believe we're safe. I think the guys at the operations level, we're safe and everything's being done fine. The problem is the emphasis is not on benign, what they would call a benign threat. So things like weather balloons, flyovers, whatever. Right now, they're just kind of like, whatever, what, this has been going on for years, so it's not really a threat. The problem is what is happening is a lot of these benign threats, low tech stuff. Uh, there's been things like, okay, the, the kid, the kid, the national air national guard kid that got caught with the docks. Right. If you notice, I don't know how many of you actually paid attention. The documents he shared were printed out. Okay. And this is something I had brought up at a location before you can go through all the x-ray detectors, whatever you want. And a lot of places don't check papers that are going out of these places. That's, that's a huge security concern. So like, Right away when I saw that, I'm like, shit, I was talking about this a decade ago with certain places. So my point is this, low tech evades better. If you keep it off the phones now, you can pretty much get away with whatever you want because the emphasis is on the lazy way. Capture everything in a big net. And I think that's kind of the emphasis at a command level. I don't know about NORAD specifically, but my guess is the emphasis is not on tracking benign threats or balloons or whatever. So this is not a surprise to me. Okay. And so my team was tracking quite a few of these, both visually and on flight radar. Um, not these in particular being reported on here, but um, my question is this. Some of the balloons that we were tracking were registered with geotags. Is it possible to counterfeit or somehow dummy up the geotags on the balloons that we are finding on flight radar, or is that absolutely corroborated information? Um, I, I guess my question is, are the ones that we are seeing that are validated by flight radars being registered, is there any way that that could be falsified and what we're tracking is actually these Chinese balloons being infiltrating? If you when, you say, when you say, when you say, you're saying geolocating. You're talking about what geotags. Exactly? So um, weather balloons have geotags and they're registered. Right. And typically on flight radar, they'll show up as a little yellow Correct. balloon or okay. red balloon. You're talking you about like transponder transponder codes, more or less, right? Yeah, specifically, I think they're called geotags for weather balloons. So those would be tracked by any kind of radar and they're aware of it and it has to be registered properly and so my question is is it possible to hijack those registration numbers that's beyond my skill set so i don't know i would speculate yeah sure why not chinese are great at tech but that's beyond my skill set and beyond my knowledge so i'm okay i'm literally just guessing but i would you have to assume they can that's that's the bottom line. You have to assume they can. The only reason I'm asking is because um, my team in particular had eyes on something that wasn't, um, didn't have a geo tag, but we later found out was just a weather balloon and it was ours, but right. it wasn't geo tagged properly. And so I'm wondering, um, do accidents happen? Is it on purpose accidents? Is, and I guess just the fact is we're seeing a large number of them now. Um, and we're going to start probably seeing more and more of them. And I'm wondering, is this just distraction? Is it real? And um, what part of this should we be paying attention to? So I heard a report. Let's see, how do I say this appropriately? That the Chinese have actually prepared. Uh, it's going to cause panic or fear. I don't do that. Um, there's lots of things that get thrown out there, possibilities plans that never get executed but one of the possibilities is you would have to assume let's just go let's just go with this let's play hypothetical i won't go with what i heard hypothetical bad guys what okay. happens what happens if what is the point of this is china just social engineering us for you know tiktok are they doing lidar based weather balloon overflights like what is the goal here do they want to go to war with us? I don't think so. I think it's intelligence gathering because they can get away with it. However, hypothetically, maybe it started off as intelligence gathering. And then they're like, damn, they're really letting us get away with this. Why don't we design this operation where we load up, I don't know, 800 balloons. And guess which one has the bad stuff in it as a contingency. 
you don't got 800 F-22s. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, for contingency operator, I'm not saying this is like an image. I'm just saying, hypothetically, they could put this stuff in their back pocket because of the response to it appears lax. Now, there, there's misinformation. Our guys can pretend that we didn't intercept something or we didn't see something because we want them to think that it's a good idea. But really, we saw it the whole time. And unfortunately, unless you're privy to that information, you're not going to know. <coughs> That's Intel counter Intel, right? So we do the, every country in the world does this with their stuff. The, the thing that's concerning to me is I've seen this trend of low tech and it's been everything from espionage, um, espionage to the balloons and otherwise other things you guys aren't even talking about that I won't bring up because it has nothing to do with SOR. <coughs> Excuse me. But all this stuff has been a trend that our adversaries have been using low tech stuff to exploit and they're putting in their back pocket what the results of that matter is. Now, maybe we got it figured. I'm not in the business. Right, I'm not there. I hope we do. I hope we're playing dumb. I hope we're playing like we didn't see it. But if it's coming out on Intel reports from specific TS servers and like it's genuine, I've seen those reports for many years. It's if, if that's real, it's probably a freaking problem. That's all I'm saying. Okay. And um, before we move on, because this is not particularly interesting to our audience, I'm sure, but I just had a curiosity because I'd been tracking it. Um, Fort Apache Reservation is just east of Phoenix. And in particular, one of these objects um, seemed to actually go against the wind to move to that location and lingered there for quite a long time without moving at about 66,000 feet. Um, my question to you would be, why is something so blatant um, not drawing more attention and being resolved? Even if it was potentially just a weather balloon, it seems like it would be infringing on airspace that is inappropriate. And so is there anything to be gleaned from this? Is this a push? Um, I'm just wondering, um, it really drew my attention because I was more along the curiosity of, are these really balloons? And that had been asked a lot, you know, I think they are. I know in some cases, I know I'd heard at least one encounter was definitely a drone of a reported balloon that got re still to this day is reported as a balloon. I know for a fact it was a drone. I'll leave it at that. I won't expand, but the reason for that was there was some other side secret squirrel stuff going on with it. So whatever, not a threat really. Um, it was a misunderstanding, but all this other stuff, as far as I know, is balloons and, but right it now. doesn't matter. It doesn't make it less. It's not like a less important. It's not less of a threat. Right. right. So it's kind of like our trust is in the same people that, managed the last three years for us so good luck <laughs> um recently uh somebody that claims to have had military contact with et and things like that claims to have things like havana syndrome as a lingering effect um glad you brought this up what are your thoughts as far as using this as evidence for contact and the reality of ufo and what are your thoughts on Havana syndrome itself? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question, Tim. Um, my thought for a long time has been that it's a radio frequency or microwave weapon because of the symptoms. And I'm not a doctor, but just looking at, I got radiated once for like two seconds and it was crazy. And they're like, you're good. If you get cancer, we'll pay the bill. Like, <laughs> but it's like, RF stuff, even even RF stuff from aircraft that we have that are completely day to day can f you up pretty bad. So if there's some secret squirrel, serious microwave weapons, which you can bet your butt there are, uh, whether they're aircraft born, whether they're UFO born, weather balloon born, or whatever, those can cause real things. And it would make sense if you're looking, especially in the intel world, where a lot of these people are talking about CIA third world countries, there are these different random posts and there's no infiltration, there's no overt stuff, there's a sighting 
and then people are hurt. It leads me to believe the credence because the symptoms and the, the illnesses are consistent with a microwave weapon. It's probably terrestrial. Now, I'm not saying that's what it is, right? Doors open on that. But it tells me because of the specific people that are getting hit with this stuff, they are people that would want to be messed with by our adversaries. And because it's something that is potentially very easily weaponizable with our current technology here terrestrially, I'm on the side that it's something advanced, like somebody else's CIA that's shitting on us or whatever. That's that's my opinion on that. Doesn't awesome. mean it is, but that it's it's logical. Um, could you clarify what an ISR aircraft is? What's an ISR aircraft? As far as what? So this is concerning the the three balloons, um, that that story. The further information on that is that it's three Raven Aerostar high altitude balloons that were launched earlier this week and currently making their way north and east. And they're okay. testing the feasibility of these balloons as ISR aircraft, and they're okay. de designating them to be maneuverable. So, like intelligence and loiter, gathering, basically. Lo yeah. Lo okay, and loiter for extended periods of time. Yeah. So ISR, I, I could be wrong. That's like intelligence, surveillance, recon, or something like that, right? So usually that's a normal aircraft, though. That's not. So calling yeah. a balloon, that's no different than flying over. Technically, I guess a U-2 could be an ISR, like AWACS, whatever. Okay. Like, I don't I don't know the exact subcategories of that, if that's what they're talking about. Well, this so, is coming from Johan Kreese. Uh, so, so I would assume they there. mean like intelligence gathering of some form. I don't know what the exact acronym is, but usually okay. that's, that's what that would be. Intel so a balloon being intelligence gathering versus... Now, the fact they call them an aircraft... I don't know. We're, are we playing on technicalities here of being powered? We might be. All we that might stuff, be. Yeah. right? But the end result is the same. Intelligence gathering. I don't know what the acronym is. I'm just... um, yeah, I don't want to circle back to that too much. Um, but um, beautiful. I appreciate that. Um, how do you feel, and this can be my last one, and I'll pass it off to Dave because I know it's going to be an early night here. Um, so how do you feel about potential? Um, so on a show called Disclosure Tonight, Richard Doty came on and put forward that he believes, and he's he's helpful, potentially somebody that helps write questions for the hearings that are going to be taken. I've heard place. of him before, yes. And so uh, Richard Doty came on Disclosure Tonight and said that potentially Roswell will be a topic that will be brought up next Wednesday, the 19th That's cool. um, in those hearings. And so my question to you would be, what kind of, how could that be proposed in a way that's going to be acceptable at that venue? What do you well, think is going to be there? Shit, I don't know. Like you're asking what I think they're going to bring about Roswell. Is it new evidence? Or are they just going to discuss what we already got? I told you all the details I know at this okay. point. Okay, yeah. So yeah. I don't know. Unless they're going to rehash Raimi and and the back end of that stuff. And again, here I sound like I know what I'm talking about, but I'm, I'm a casual for you guys. But that's a pretty big event, so I know more than most about that event. But um, unless they're going to go on the walk us through the back end of the paperwork that disappeared or was classified or transport, I don't want to hear any more about the crash itself personally. And here's why. That evidence is gone, right? So if you're coming forward and you're saying, hey, we have some evidence, I think it's important to show the administrative evidence trail now, whether it went the right path, whether it did whatever it did, if you guys are blowing whistles now, because there's going to be paperwork somewhere on that. The physical evidence, if there's a UFO or not a UFO or a craft or not a craft, it's either in a private corporate hangar somewhere or it never existed, one of the two at this point. Okay. To you had to believe that. So if they're going to bring something, I hope it's something administrative with the guys that handled the case and either proving or disproving the custody of care of whatever was recovered there. That's what I would like to see. If not, it's kind of just dog and pony again. 
Okay. Can whistleblowers be subpoenaed? Dave, do you know for this? I don't know. <clears throat> I really don't. Okay. I was just uh, wondering how deep they were going to how deep they were going to go into the Wilson Davis document. Sorry to walk on you there. Anybody uh, can be subpoenaed by for a hearing, but you also have your Fifth Amendment right to not incriminate and not to speak. You've seen this at many hearings before where people didn't want to play ball on an obvious whether all the way back to Iran Contra to now, like you could go to anything, you know, even more serious or less serious things. They can call you there. But if you're not being accused of a crime and you're not on trial, you can just take the fifth. <laughs> right. Simple as that. That's your right. Dave, go ahead. I'm sorry I stepped on you there. No, no, you didn't step on me at all, man. I'm just doing my editing. Um, because potentially we could have um, Wilson Davis, um, Admiral Wilson and Eric Davis potentially be subpoenaed about the Wilson Davis document leak and asked about the details within those papers. Um, I mean, that would be something massive, I feel. If that was, if it hadn't already been done, that would be something really huge for that to be brought up at the hearing. Um, because that would definitely lead to Roswell. It leads to reverse technology. Um, and I think that that is the underlying theme and That's perhaps the what, trail they're going down. Yeah, that was exactly what I was saying, though. Show us the show us the chain of custody with stuff. Because the evidence is gone. So let's stop. I know we all want to know. But like, if you want to get somewhere, we need someone to say, hey, we have evidence that something was moved here and there. And then get, get that paperwork. <laughs> we don't need... We don't, you're not going to ever get a hold of whatever it was that's gone. Do you feel that anecdotal evidence, no matter what the sources is, is ever going to be good enough for these, no. this group? No, unless they come out with hardcore, either an official DOD video that's been archived, DOD photographs that have been archived or that chain of custody that's signed by an official that we know is to be authentic. Absent of those three things, this case will never be solved. It will never be adequate to the public, to the researchers, to anybody else. It needs one of those three things. It will never happen. I don't, I don't have a lot of hope for it, but whatever. If it happens, it happens. And then I guess finally, the big question of the night that Dave were pondering over, um, the concept of NHI and how the human race would accept it. And do you think we're ready? Mm. Ready for in what capacity? Dave? <laughs> well, like I stated earlier, I, I don't believe humanity is ready for any sort of alien uh, contact. Why do you think that, though? I got to ask. Because I'm the skeptic guy. He did think cover it on the show tonight. Uh, sorry, I was busy trying to do a movie night with a special person. Mm -hmm. So that's the second, second night around. This is just, you know, <clears throat> doesn't bode sorry. well. Sorry, I'm like a 16-year-old boy sometimes. He's watching Skinamax, and we're doing... Actually, we were watching a, a rom-com, but anyways, what... No, it's cool, man. It's good, because no, my point way, was we'll get your my... fresh perspective. It's good. Just give me the b the bullet, right? <laughs> yeah. Um. Just let's say, and I think this was the point, if if our government was to disclose today that aliens have been here... And they still are. And they're from out there. Yes. Are we ready for that truth? If we were to be like, this is absolutely true. And it's true. Mm -hmm. Are we as a human race ready from the smallest little town in, uh, in uh, India all the way to the biggest cities? Uh, here's the great thing planet? about here's the great thing about the human race. Some of us can't handle daily life right now. Have you opened Twitter lately? <laughs> you know what I mean? People that are going to overreact to politics or entertainment or media or advertisements are going to definitely overreact to aliens. I'd like to hope the same way as when we see political polls and then you realize only half the country voted that the half that doesn't vote is kind of like we're chill, bro. Like you're not, they're not helping, but they're not causing a problem. So I think, the base of people, the majority would be fine. I think some lunatics would lose their shit and we'd have some immediate problems. But as we went on, and those people mostly calm down or die, 
<laughs> that that life will get better as the, as as humans progress and generations progress. Our children's children will just be like, "Cool, what aliens are visiting this week?" You know, or whatever. Like they'll be fine with it. It's trippy to us if it's real because we've been told the lie forever since we were born, and our parents were told it, and our grandparents were told it. So if we're the ones that actually get the truth, which I think Gen X will get the truth if it is there. If it's there, Gen X will get the truth. And I already explained why. Wait for the boomers to die, and we're going to be on the moon, and we're going to be all over space, and, and the average citizen will be able to look anywhere in the world anytime they want on the moon here, Mars. You're not going to be able to hide it anymore. So yes, in the next 20 to 30 years, if aliens exist, it won't be a conspiracy. We can literally all individually will have the technology in our hands to live stream anywhere in space. It's going to happen. And yeah. you will know the truth. It's going to happen, Tim. I can't and then there's no reason to hold a secret anymore. And all these conversations about disclosure go away. Yeah. Simple as that. Yeah, I mean, our kids are growing up with Mandalorian. <laughs> Best show ever. Pretty true. I Gentlemen, mean, <laughs> time of the night where we got to say goodbye to each and every one of you because old Davey has to work in the morning. Ooh. And work that pole, Dave. <laughs> uh, they have $73%, $73 believe that you got aliens. Ouchies. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Derek. Galloway, Maggie, <laughs> Thomas times two, Don, Vaughn, Louis times two, Greg, Mark, W. David Page for the amazing super chats tonight. Very much appreciate the love and the support, everyone, that you give us. Hey, Arlie, how you doing, man? Good to see you. Arlie believes it was just a dream, by the way. It was just a dream. In yeah. case anybody was wondering. <laughs> All right, boys, I'm out of here. Thanks, RG. We'll see you soon, buddy. Don't forget after hours at Jessica Jones this weekend. Thank you so much, everyone, for a great week. I will be back on Monday, where my guest will be Daniel Harari. Sweet. We're gonna have a great time talking UFOs again. Right on, Dave. Have a great night. Thanks, audience. We'll see you Little soon. Jimmy Senor, great job tonight, my man. Thanks, buddy. See you soon. Talk to you soon. Take care, everyone. Helping my friend. You too. You need bail money, give me a call. Always, Dad. Take care. <laughs> you too.